Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Excursions Australia Conference. Um, for those of you that know me, my name is Karen, um, and I'm one of the directors with Ben, um, who will be popping up on screen shortly, um, from Virtual Excursions Australia. We've got a few more people coming in, so we will um, just spend a few minutes um, just sort of introducing the, the way today will go. Um, and yeah, we're very excited to start the year off. I know it's February and it's not quite the beginning of the year, but it still is the beginning of a lot of the work that we'll be uh, looking at. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we are all coming from today, from across Australia, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders, um, and especially anyone with Indigenous heritage that is joining us from anywhere across Australia and around the world today. So it's going to be a really great session. Uh, we've got some international speakers. We've got uh, Jason from the Moat Marine uh, Laboratory. We've got Megan coming from the Royal Terrell uh, Museum. We've got our favourite friend, Bonnie from Dart Learning, who is always there to support us with our um, online and digital uh, and virtual excursions. Um, especially with the New South Wales Department of Education focus. So really awesome to hear from everyone today. Hopefully we'll get a little bit inspired um, about um, different opportunities to collaborate throughout Australia and around the world and have a chance to ask questions from some amazing content providers um, internationally and, yeah, just have a good chat. So really a lot of what we're talking about was joining the conversation, starting that conversation in 2023 about what is possible in the online learning um, sphere. So, Ben, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, you've done very well as usual, Karen. Welcome to those people. I think every, most people know me, but I'm Ben Newsom from Physics Education and Virtual Excursions Australia. I've been working with Karen and Steve for many, many years on virtual excursions things and... Uh, Honestly, this conference is just hanging out with some mates, some friends that know a lot of stuff about distance learning. And that's the point. You can share ideas as much as we have lined up speakers. And honestly, my friends, Jason, Megan, Bonnie, they know what they're doing. But so do everyone in the audience. So please share your ideas throughout this session. Absolutely. And um, there will be a, a time to have a bit of a break and a stretch because it is a, you know, a couple hour stretch. That is definitely the case. Uh, but um, certainly, yeah. Chat away. Feel free to even interrupt, even me right now, to say a thing if you need to. So we'll be doing that throughout. So uh, with, let's get actually into it because we've got a bit to, to do. So I really want to introduce my really good friend, Jason Robert Shaw from Moat Marine Laboratories in Sarasota, Florida. I was lucky to hang out with him in Moat Marine Laboratories in uh, 2018 when I visited with my family there. It's such a really great spot to check out. There's a bit of a heads up. He is the technical director of the C-Track virtual learning programs and the multi reader producer for the free C-Show content. Bucket load of background when it comes to being a Florida master naturalist. So if you want to know about underwater stuff, Jason's your guy. He's so, a shark. Uh, <laughs> shark swimming behind him. Absolutely. So you know what? I'm going to stop yammering on because the person you probably want to hear about is Jason. So I'm going to hand it over to you, mate. Go for it. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, five... 34 here in the Eastern time zone of the United States. And it's great to see you all uh, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's around 930 in the morning over there. And uh, yeah, I want to share with you some of the uh, uh, opportunities we have to connect. And uh, this is a global classroom and uh, we'd be uh, happy to actually uh, tune in and join you all over there in Australia or anywhere in between. So good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you're at. So let me show you on my map where I'm speaking to you from. Let's go ahead and zoom in on here. And if you know where Disney World is in Florida, it's in the center of our state. We're a little about two hours to the left and to the south of that on a place called City Island, right in the middle of Sarasota Bay. Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium uh, was founded back in 1955 by a really remarkable woman named Dr. Eugenie Clark. And she was one of the first scientists to actually study living sharks in a serious and systematic way. And uh, so much so that she became known as the shark lady. And uh, she founded our laboratory in a, in a single shack down there in Cape Hayes. And eventually we moved up here to City Island. And we've since expanded to 20 other research programs from coral reefs, uh, uh, of course, sharks, sea turtles, manatees, and everything in between. And uh, what I do here at Moat is provide these learning opportunities, these uh, science and technology, engineering and math experts, uh, make them available virtually uh, to come into your locations, into your classrooms, into your organizations, into your audiences, 
and uh, share the kind of research that we do here. And uh, we uh, offer programming for all ages, uh, from pre-kindergarten pre all the way up to uh, high school and lifelong learners and adults as well. In fact, uh, Dr. Clark is uh, kind of a, an interesting story, literally, because we have this story book uh, that we uh, have permission from the authors and publishers to share. Uh, this is for, of course, the younger uh, scientists out there, but we uh, connect with them and read this, auto, or read this biography about Dr. Clark's early adventures and uh, career uh, studying sharks. And uh, we use this kind of green screen technology that you see behind me. And uh, we throw our educators into the storybook uh, without them getting wet and uh, bring in all kinds of multimedia to share with them. But the uh, actual story of distance learning here at Moat goes a little bit uh, back uh, before I started here, and it began with this fella here. Uh, does anyone by chance know who this guy is? You can type it in the chat if you have any guesses. He's a kind of famous oceanographer. I'll give you a hint there. I'm feeling bad, Jason. You've told me this multiple times. <laughs> and no worries if you don't know. Uh, this is a guy named Dr. Robert Ballard, and he's a uh, US oceanographer and a scientist, and he's retired from our Navy. Uh, but he was the fella who, uh, along with his team, discovered the resting place of the RMS Titanic back in the 1980s. And this is where Moat Marine Laboratory got its start with distance learning, because this uh, gentleman got such an outpouring of interest from teachers and students about his adventures that he ended up creating an educational program called the Jason Project. Now, no affiliation with me. It was named after the Argonaut of myth and legend. And uh, he named his remotely operated vehicle, the Jason. And uh, he would go out to the places like the Galapagos, to Belize, Alaska, the Mediterranean, and points in between, and beam back via satellite uh, these thrilling adventures that he would go on with uh, teachers and students. And we would bring these kids in by the bus load, and they would uh, learn about all the different kinds of science adventures. And it only happened one time a year. Um, and then, as inevitably happens, technology marches on. And uh, we here at Mo kind of got the idea of, uh, that this was a, a good idea to maybe try in-house. And so we started to do some demonstration projects with uh, the Nickelodeon Entertainment Company and MCI WorldCom doing these little tiny <laughs> postage stamp size video conferences with uh, classrooms around the world. And uh, eventually led to this program that we call C-Trek, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And back then we were using ISDN phone lines. It was a very expensive, kind of complicated process to try to bring uh, these little tiny postage stamp videos into the classroom. Uh, for those of you who've been doing this for a while, you might recognize uh, words like Tanberg and Polycom, and this even predates some of them. But fortunately for us, those very expensive high uh, bandwidth phone lines went away in the 90s. And in the 2000s, we got, of course, the internet, and we also got our own studio. So here at Moat, we now have this uh, wonderful uh, space that you can see behind me now. Uh, where we can have our educators come into your classroom uh, from these uh, studio spaces and uh, have control over lighting and sound and audio so that we can bring these experiences to them and bring our science education uh, experts into the studio to communicate with them. And of course, nowadays we do this in high definition, and this is kind of what it looks like behind the scenes for a typical day for me. Uh, usually I'm at the control board as I am today, um, making things happen, but uh, the educators are on the other side of the glass that's in front of me, and they're able to focus uh, exclusively on instruction and interacting with the uh, students. It's a nice luxury to have when you don't have to worry about messing around with the bu buttons and audio levels, at least from our side. <laughs> I can't help it help you out on your side. You're still going to have to figure that out, but uh, we do try to make it as seamless as possible, and uh, so much so that we've actually been recognized with a couple of pinnacle awards from a group called CILC, uh, for our excellence in uh, broadcast and uh, customer service. So that's a great uh, honor to have, and it's all in recognition from educators like you uh, that makes that happen. And of course, nowadays, you don't even need a uh, big gold polycom room system. You can have just a little eye device. Uh, a lot of us were probably, uh, you're tuning in on some kind of uh, phone or something like that. Uh, we can go anywhere, do anything. It's, it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish. And so that's what we try to do. We bring our STEM experts into the classroom uh, in our studio. And uh, we also not only have these live interactive programs, but a lot of times we'll do um, streaming programs, some pre-recorded programs, and uh, make them available with this technology to classrooms. So let's go ahead and take a look at what one of these things might look like. So you connect with me or my uh, educators here at Moat, and uh, we're sitting here on standby, getting ready to begin our program. 
And uh, we try to put up some information for the teachers ahead of time to let you know what you're tuning in for, because we don't always, uh, not always sure uh, what you're getting in there, right? Uh, you don't always know what uh, you've been signed up for. So we try to make it as easy and seamless as possible and uh, give you as much information before the program starts, before we launch right in and uh, talk to you about different things like the reptiles that are here at Moat. Now, I would love to bring a three or 400 pound sea turtle into the studio, but that can be a little bit uh, logistically challenging. So we have these little surrogates of theirs. Uh, we have a box turtle and also some uh, terrapins here at Moat. And we can bring these in and talk about reptile characteristics and analogize those over to the sea turtles. I've talked a lot about the uh, studio-based programs, but of course, we've all been through this horrible pandemic the past couple of years. And hopefully you're a little bit more familiar with this technology, but it's also given us the affordance to head back out into our exhibit spaces and actually bring you uh, programming directly from uh, where our animals and our exhibits are located. So I can broadcast now from the top of our manatee habitat. You all have dugongs over there in that part of the world, but we have a cousin of the dugong, the manatee. And we can also broadcast from the top of our shark habitat. And this is what that kind of looks like. And these are all live and interactive. I bring a um, portable distance learning kit over to these locations, mic up our uh, educators, and uh, we can hear you all and you can hear and see us uh, it's not kind of hard for us with the portable kit to actually see your uh, audience sometimes, but we can definitely hear them, answer their questions, and also deliver a pretty fascinating program. And one of the neat ones that uh, I just recently uh, started, which might be of interest to you all since uh, the time zones can be a challenge, is this new program that I am calling Good Night Aquarium. Now, we might uh, call it Good Morning Aquarium, uh, considering your time zone, but what I do is I go into our aquarium galleries after it closes to the public, which is 5 p.m. my time, which is right now. And because the aquarium galleries are closed, I have it all to myself. We have it all to ourselves. And so we can seamlessly go around the gallery spaces without being interrupted. And uh, that's available uh, at a perfect time for a lot of you beginning your day. Uh, that's generally available about 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. my time, which should be around, I guess, 9 to 10 or 11 a.m. your time. And that's called Goodnight Aquarium. And you can scan that little QR code if you're uh, savvy enough to snap a picture of that. If not, I'm sure Ben will be furiously Googling it right now and adding it to the chat in just a moment. But that's really fun. And of course, since they're going to sleep, we learn a little bit about the different circadian rhythms of the day and how we take care of the different animals. Most of them are animals found in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean near us here at Moat in Sarasota. But we do have some animals that you might be more familiar with. We do have lionfish which have been introduced into the Caribbean from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we also have those shrimp fish, and uh, we also have some ribbon horses, uh, ribbon pipe horses, uh, which are, I believe are found over there in Australia. And so we have some animals that your uh, audiences might be more familiar with, uh, especially some of you I know are scuba divers out there. And then in addition to those adventures where we have the studio-based programs, now the exhibit tours that we do, every once in a while, our scientists are out in the field and we have an opportunity co to connect with them if they're close enough to shore or in a location where we can get a really good signal. And so what we do is whenever that's possible, we'll actually connect with them and bring those adventures right back to you. So here you can see some of our shark scientists working with the group OSEARCH, where they actually tag and track uh, oceanic white sharks and other large uh, shark species. And they have this remarkable vessel where they're able to uh, bring the animals up alongside the uh, boat, uh, raise them up in this little lift-like structure you see here. Uh, they quickly work up on them. They take blood samples, tag them, and uh, as quickly as possible, release them back out in the ocean. Because uh, even though these are really big animals, uh, whale sharks, uh, white sharks, and many others, uh, we still don't know a lot about their, even their most basic biology. And so our scientists are trying to use those tagging and tracking technologies just to figure out where do they go, um, where do they breed, uh, where are their uh, feeding grounds, and uh, by having a kind of baseline information like that, we can better manage those resources for everyone. And so that's a uh, part of the MBO search uh, program. We try to bring those whenever possible. And you can find out all about this kind of information on the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. And you're going to have uh, the fabulous Miss Tammy on a little bit later to tell you all about CILC. And uh, they have a neat program called the Community of Learning Events, which are free programs. And uh, I just offered one yesterday for Valentine's Day called I Love the Ocean. It was all about life cycles of the sea. 
And uh, you can find out more about that at CILC, as well as a lot of paid programs that are available to uh, audiences, again, from uh, very early elementary all the way up to uh, high school and beyond. And uh, speaking of some of those free shows, one of the other things I try to do at least once a month is what I call the C show, and that's free. And uh, these are specialty topics on a scheduled basis. And I try to offer these at least once a month. Again, we did the Valentine program yesterday for us. But sometimes we'll uh, do other programs too, going to uh, different experts or locations. And uh, I post those on CILC whenever they're available. And also on our website, mote.org, M-O-T-E dot O-R-G. So you probably know already how to make all this magic happen, but let's just review in case you don't. Uh, here at Moat, we try to connect by whatever means necessary. So we'll use whatever technology you need in order co to connect. So if you want to use uh, Zoom, that's great. We love using Zoom. Uh, if you want to use um, Google Hangouts, we'll use Google Hangouts. Uh, basically, you need some kind of computer or device in order to connect. And then uh, WebEx or even Skype, if anyone still uses that these days, we will use that to connect. Some kind of large screen or projector if you're doing it in a classroom type situation. And of course, a really good uh, webcam. Uh, we really love it when we can see who we're connecting with. That doesn't always work out. And a speaker or microphone. And uh, pro tip, a lot of times uh, teachers will try to use a laptop, which has a great mic when you're video conferencing right there next to the laptop but try to see if you can find a way of maybe getting a, a pod microphone or some kind of system where you can bring that audio. Basically, you're gonna grab my ear off that laptop and try to bring it into the classroom so that I can easily hear all of your students or your audience, because if not, they'll have to walk up to the laptop so that I can hear them. They're great for conferencing one-on-one, -on -one, but those laptop uh, microphones, they can be a challenge when you're trying to do a whole room. So again, let's kind of look at what it uh, is like a day in the life of a video conference program. You connect Good with Good afternoon our, uh, and hello experts. to all of my friends up at Springfield Elementary. My name is Ross and I'm coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory all the way down in Sarasota, Florida. Yeah, so we try to make it as engaging and energetic as possible. Um, I told you a little bit about that one, uh, what I call see me read title from Dr. Eugenie Clark. But we have a few others as well. Here's one called Shark Baby. And again, we have permission from the authors and the publishers to adapt these storybooks into an interactive lesson. So we can throw our educators into the storybook using green screen technology. We read it together. And then we have kind of a comprehension quiz section at the end where we try to see if they were paying attention during the program or have any other questions about the sea creatures that we were learning about in that particular storybook. And whenever possible, like you saw with Sam, <clears throat> the box turtle, we try to bring live animals uh, into the studio. And when we can't do that, we'll bring in webcams from our exhibit. So here's a feed into our manatee habitat. We also have a feed into our shark habitat. And so we bring those all into our programs, trying to make it a multimedia experience, not just a talking head going on boringly with uh, just a single screen share. We try to mix it up with as much uh, interaction as possible to try to keep the attention going and um, one of the other things though that often happens though is we don't get to all the questions that the students have. And so we've partnered with Microsoft with Flipgrid, now just called Flip. And uh, you can find out more about that by going to flipgrid.com slash C-Trek. I think Ben was the person who uh, introduced me to this. I'm not quite sure if I remember right, but anyways, it's a great resource for both uh, for asynchronous content. So you can um, actually uh, record a video uh, message to me uh, for, or your students can with your permission. And uh, I'll research it or get our subject matter experts to research it. And then uh, we'll respond back with a video voicemail message back to them uh, using the Flip uh, platform. Uh, it's a safe and secure website from Microsoft. Now I heard, uh, Ben, you were talking about your school year uh, just starting off. Of course, it's a little different for us, but uh, here in Florida, we have our summer camps during uh, uh, May, June, July, August but I am still in the studio doing virtual programming during what is typically our off season, but is now your on season. And so if you wanna connect over the, what is our summer months, um, we are uh, active and available. And uh, I will be offering uh, summer camp programs virtually uh, for students during those months, uh, but I'll still be here in the studio and available to connect if you're interested. And then, the unlikely possibility, but you never know, the chance that you might actually have a chance to come visit us here in Florida for an extended period of time. I also run a lot of the lifelong learning programs 
on site. So we have these available to adult learners to come to our uh, campus and learn all about Florida habitats, biomes, and ecology. We call that the Florida Master Naturalist Program. And that's another thing that I do during the summer. Well, I'm just about out of my content. Hope I didn't breeze through it too fast, but uh, yeah, I wanna pause here and uh, just uh, take a breather. Uh, don't know if we're doing Q&A now or if you wanna uh, wait for another section later in the program, Ben. I actually uh, would love to have um, some questions from everyone around this. I mean, I, you've been doing this for many years, guys. Seriously, Jason has just touched an iceberg of the knowledge he sort of kind of gets up to. It actually crossed my mind when you mentioned the life learning, lifelong learners. How do you reach those learners just out of uh, curiosity? Because, I mean, they may be difficult for some. Yeah, and it can be a little bit of a different challenge. Of course, we have pedagogy with the uh, children, and uh, these are all new and novel experiences for them. So it's a lot of times the first time they're encountering it. But then when you go to uh, lifelong learning and adults, you've got your andragogy, and this is something that they're probably referencing back to prior knowledge. And they probably have already the baseline information. So you kind of have to respect and understand that and make it a little bit more collaborative and meaningful for adult audiences. And uh, we already have a curriculum in place with the Master Naturalist program, but uh, when we're doing it virtually, uh, no matter how young or old you are, this technology can be a challenge. And so we try to build in as many affordances and time as possible to work through the uh, inevitable hiccups that we have. And on the back end, uh, when I do these virtually, we'll uh, have real-time uh, video Zoom connections for uh, lifelong learning. And then we have an asynchronous back end uh, through a Google Classroom instance uh, that supports uh, what we're learning together. And that usually has the secondary information or the pre or post reading articles that uh, are, go along with any of the instruction. And uh, it's not really for a grade. And so it's really just for their own um, benefit and uh, continuing education. Just uh, while waiting for a few questions to come through, I just have a, uh, a thought around the Flipgrid side of things. Uh, it takes time to research. Do you find that a lot of the schools are using this or it seems to be a, like a occasional sort of thing? It's more of an occasional sort of thing. We'll get one or two teachers that are really into that technology and I'll get hammered with like 10 or 20 at one time. And then it'll be a long dry spell. And a lot of the questions are related to the topic that we just covered. So we're pretty well versed in what we do. And uh, if we can, we'll try to record them the same day that they come in and answer them back um, or we'll get to them as close as possible. Uh, very rarely do we get questions that completely stump us. We just had a question from Mary Bell. Mary's been doing a lot of uh, programming over the years. She's got a question here saying, she's interested in the label that you had for the turtle. Yeah, so he's a box turtle. Unfortunately, Sam's in the other room right now going to sleep or else I would have brought him in here. But it's an interesting species that we have here in North America. It's not a true tortoise, but it is a land turtle. And uh, I know, I think uh, the terminology is kind of weird depending where you go. I think everything is a turtle in Australia, right? Uh, oh gosh, I don't want to answer that. I don't know. Uh, What's the term? Yes. Yeah. So often we just refer to everything as turtles and then, yeah. Yeah. But maybe someone then, from HQ might be able to give us more input there on, um, on the specifications. But yeah, generally we use turtle to cover everything. And then we've got like different names for our freshwater and um, marine. Yeah. So uh, here in the North America, typically we call the freshwater. Uh, Testidines, uh, we call them uh, turtles. Uh, we also have one that lives in brackish water that's called a terrapin. And then anything that's up on land, we call a tortoise. And the point about the box turtle is it's just a weird little in-between species. Also interesting because it has a little hinge on the bottom part of its shell called a plastron. And that little hinge actually folds up like a little jewel box. A lot of tortoises can pull their limbs in, but that one has an especially great ability to close up shop and, and tuck in tight. And so uh, that is a rescue animal. Uh, it was uh, kept as a pet for a long time in not very great conditions and then went to an animal rescue rehab place and ultimately ended up with us as an animal ambassador so that we can continue to teach about his cousins out there in nature. Uh, he's also missing a little uh, part of his uh, right uh, front foot. So uh, he's not really suitable for release back out in nature. One of the things I know uh, is that you've got a deep background in behind the scenes, pressing the buttons and making the things happen when they need to. And now you're front of camera too, but sometimes the buttons don't work so well. And we just had a question there about, have you had challenges with the technology when the buttons, the things break? 
Yep, yep, yes, I do. And it is a challenge uh, when I have to do the presentation and the technical direction. Uh, fortunately, this one has a button called fade to black. So if anything really catastrophic goes at the, my emergency escape button is the fade to black and then try to fix it as quickly as possible. Uh, but like Ben, I've been doing this for a number of years. So I've got a flow and that takes a lot of practice, practice, practice. Uh, by this point, I've memorized most of the scripts, but we can go off script and customize the programs if we need to. Um, but basically, I, I know what's supposed to come up next and I know where to go to get it on my computers uh, that are in front of me. So hopefully I can put something meaningful up. But every once in a while, something just goes completely bonkers and I just have to take a, remind myself to breathe, take a breath and uh, maybe have a little breakout session or some kind of uh, moment of uh, reflection while I uh, scramble to figure things out. Well, that's one of those things, your content uh, knowledge is so deep. Remember we were doing a podcast and you would just, we just randomly start talking about Wobby Gone Sharks and bang, up on the screen straight away and you had something to share. It was just so cool. Um, and it does, it really feels seamless. Um, uh, we just had a question just then too about, okay, there's lots of microphones. There's plenty. Oh, there you go. Look at that. <laughs> Jason doesn't mess around. He really doesn't. There goes the Wobby Gone straight up. Zebra now we have also. a zebra shark here, which is a species normally found over there. So that's another new addition to our aquarium. <laughs> oh, awesome. And seriously, by the way, it's really worth visiting the aquarium. I've been there. It's, it's very, very cool. Um, we had actually a tech, tech question. I mean, there are lots of bits of hardware and some do better than others. So out of the microphones, if you had a, a, a classroom teacher you're saying, you know what, what should I get? What would you recommend? Well, one of the things that our local school board gave to us, and this was a couple of years ago, so it might be uh, even better technology nowadays, was uh, what's called a Chat 150 by Clear One. And uh, I'll grab the link here. And that's worked pretty reliably for over a decade uh, or more. And so um, let me put that into the link. And that is typical. There's a lot of different manufacturers for that kind of device, but uh, it's very useful because it has a long USB cord. It has uh, buttons solid buttons for mute and unmute and volume. And every computer I've thrown this at connects to it without too much problem. And the nice thing too, is it has echo cancellation built into it. So uh, you don't have to worry about feedback most of the time. And they make those in different sizes. This is a little spendy up front. Um, I think it's a couple hundred bucks, but uh, has been a uh, rock solid for me over the year. And that's what our school boards have used. And Polycom, now Poly, makes a, a variety of these kinds of devices, but uh, a nice USB speaker microphone works pretty well and that kind of pod-like configuration. And uh, that uh, has been a, a winner for us. What are your thoughts around um, bringing in the virtual world type things in there? Have you seen much of that happening uh, towards North America? You mean like VR augmented yeah. reality stuff? Yeah, all that sort yeah. of stuff. Are you seeing that come through? Uh, there's a couple of folks, especially in the zoo and aquarium industry that are trying to especially explore this because they're kind of in that museum education exploratory learning space. And so they have the ability to explore those a little bit more readily. Our friend Paul Hieronymus has a whole kit. And I just spoke to him this morning. He's at a distance learning program or a school uh, program over in Ohio in the United States. And uh, apparently he has a whole little uh, a gaggle of uh, goggles. Uh, that the kids can put on and explore together in some kind of controlled space. And you would have to ask him uh, what kind of platform he's using, because uh, that's a challenge, right, with those, is once the kids strap on the goggles, you don't know what they're looking at, if they're paying attention. So hopefully whatever uh, platform you're using, uh, you have some kind of uh, supervisory uh, ability to see what's going on in the space. And I know Nearpod is another one that has uh, 3D affordances, and uh, that can be kind of ex uh, uh, exceptional, too, for bringing in uh, uh, 3D content into the classroom. As I Google and throw it in the chat just there. So um, absolutely. And actually, if you've ever, if you do ever get a chance, everyone listening in to hang out with Paul Hieronymus, they do this really good thing at the end of the year, which is the, um, it's like a read around the planet, but this time it's for the end of the year. Um, they do a Christmas thing. It's very, very fun. So yeah, rec recommend you can get involved. Actually, that's a point. Working with the authors, do you find that it's challenging to get permissions and all the rest to be able to broadcast? Because effectively, you're, you're broadcasting their content. How does that work? Yeah, so we have to get a formal writing, uh, write up in a contract kind of thing. And uh, we explain that uh, we're not doing this for profit. Um, where we do charge a program fee, but that mostly covers connectivity. And if they are agreeable, we'll do it. And if not, uh, we can't. And so we just uh, go through the uh, challenge of asking in the first place. And a lot of times publishers have no idea what we're talking about. 
or it's a use case that they're not really familiar with. Uh, I would say that was more common before the pandemic. And then the publishers really got hammered with these kind of uh, read requests, especially from libraries and librarians. Uh, but ultimately we try to respect the intellectual property of the authors and the publishers as much as possible. And uh, we don't wanna offer anything that we can't uh, explicitly have their permission to use and adapt. And so uh, the thing is I go in there and I kind of pull the storybook apart uh, and then lightly animate it to try to make the uh, content and meaning um, appropriate. And so we might focus on different parts of the page as we're explaining or reading the story together. And uh, in this 16 by nine format that we're typically in that uh, doesn't always fit those storybooks perfectly. So we'll do the pan and scan type thing, which was very popular with the Ken Burns effect, if you're familiar with that. And uh, we do try to make sure. Now, if there are any um, authors out there, and in fact, um, there is an excellent from Cicero um, over there in Australia, they have a couple of great STEM storybooks on the bobtail squid and uh, coral reefs, and maybe Reef Ed is familiar with some of those. Uh, we don't have permission to adapt those, but they've done an excellent job of adapting them themselves for interactivity, and so I'd recommend those. I'll see if I can look it up. Uh, absolutely. The um, I was actually just thinking about there's something that's going back. Uh, gosh, it would be it'd be a decade now. Gosh, we're getting old. But I'm just curious around the um, the, ex the exhibitions that uh, were for hire for libraries, whereby they look like effectively a museum exhibit being installed into a library or public space, but you brought video conferencing into it. And so you could beam in there. Are you guys still doing that? Well, it's kind of funny. We have some uh, visitors from um, Australia visiting us at the aquarium right now. And I'll see if I can bring it up. Uh, it's uh, the uh, company Flying Fish Exhibits. And I'm pretty sure they're based out of Australia. And uh, they have something called Voyage to the Deep, which is a traveling exhibit that we are installing as I speak um, here at Moat. And uh, it's basically a Jules Verne steampunk type exhibit. Um, and I put the link into the uh, chat. And so this is a little bit different than what you're talking about just now, Ben. But what I'm going to try to do is uh, February, March, and April, um, I'll use this uh, space as a backdrop using that portable distance learning program. I still haven't fully developed the program yet because the exhibits haven't been installed yet. Uh, but talk about giant squid, uh, talk about steampunk technology, and uh, maybe even use this as a backdrop for a virtual escape room based on Jules Verne and some of those other things. And uh, then the other thing that you were talking about is we had a grant from a group called uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, where we spent a couple of years building our own small traveling exhibits and integrating technology into it. And this was before the uh, whole idea of uh, Zoom video conferencing was really uh, uh, current. And uh, we would send those off to different places like the uh, Las Vegas Natural History Museum or uh, Cranbrook Institute up in Michigan. And uh, we would have these small interactive displays on coral reefs, on sea monsters, and on um, sea life rescue. And uh, we integrated video conferencing technology into those things with a couple of polycon systems. And uh, they would uh, be the basis for our miniature theater space for the museum visitors to connect with us and learn about the programs. And when we weren't actually doing live programming out of these miniature exhibits, uh, we would uh, just have looping video related to the content of the uh, small, um, they were kind of like a couple of kiosks uh, tied together. I really loved them. I thought it was such a, such a great idea. <laughs> it came to Amy memory. has a great question. I see that there in the uh, chat room. And uh, let me share one of my uh, favorite educational resources with you. It's called Breakout EDU. And uh, these are both physical uh, escape room kits that you can use in the classroom, but you can virtualize them too. So if you were doing a Zoom a conference, uh, you can all go to a communal breakout EDU website. And uh, basically it's a lock box with a series of six to seven different kinds of locks. There's a key lock, a padlock, a number lock, a word lock. And if you had this in the classroom, you would put clues around the classroom and uh, then you would uh, send the kids to investigate the, the answers to a couple of riddles and one uh, key unlocks another. And so it's a way to uh, basically simulate an escape room type experience in the classroom uh, using their breakout boxes, but they virtualize it. So instead of uh, using a physical box in a physical location, you can all be spread out over a Zoom conference, but have a common uh, virtual uh, lock box that you can then uh, put the codes in and unlock that way. And they have an incredible amount of affordances and uh, uh, resources on how to build these on their website. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. Does it take much time to put that together? Yes and no. Sometimes you already have, like if you, if I had to 
build one about sharks, it would probably take me an hour, right? Because I have that background knowledge. But if I had to research something about Charles Darwin or the uh, voyage of the HMS Beagle, it might take me a little bit more time to get all the clues together. And of course, you want to align it to whatever curriculum you're trying to teach as well. And uh, so that might take a little time. But they've got these whole uh, little uh, brainstorming sheets and uh, a structure and some uh, frameworks uh, for you to basically just fill in the blanks almost. And then boom, you've got it. And yes, there is a subscription cost with it. Uh, you can get it the first time and unlock a lot of it. And then they have a lot of free resources too, if you explore around on there. And uh, those are available to you for free. And this is kind of an open source project. So you can buy their kit and their subscription, but the concept is open source. You can go to any hardware store, buy a tool chest, slap uh, five or six different locks on it and build it out using that uh, framework that they do av make available on their website. So we've been talking a lot about what we're doing now and what we've done in the past, can you see a potential change in the horizon for virtual learning programs and events? Are they likely to go more and more towards hybrid? Is there more technology that we're not aware that's starting to come through the pipeline? I mean, what do you think about as we think to, you know, five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years? I want you to give me a crystal ball. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Yeah, so one of the groups that I hang out a lot with, my brain trust, if you will, is a group called officehours.global. And they're a group of uh, professional live event uh, folks who do this every day. So if you had a microphone question or, and uh, every Saturday is devoted towards education, which would be a Sunday uh, evening, I think your time, the way it's set up. But um, yeah, check them out and uh, see if they can answer that. But uh, yeah, they feel, and I agree, that uh, this isn't going away. Uh, we've gone to conferences before, Ben, where you ran out to the uh, teacher's uh, audience and tried to see who knew about video conferencing. And I think it was always less than 30% uh, of the people that you quizzed uh, even had a clue that this technology was available. It's probably changed a lot in the past two or three years if you were to try to do that again. But uh, I can see definitely uh, within the short scale now, there's a pretty much a pullback away from virtual events. It's convenient and, and helpful, uh, but I think people are really to, ready to go meet in person again. But I think they'll have a snap back where the, the affordances and ease of use of a lot of these technologies will continue to be a, a something that is of value. Um, and of course, uh, we call these virtual field trips sometimes. Um, and students here in Florida would never necessarily have a chance to go visit the folks at Reef, uh, uh, ED. Um, and visit the Barrier Reef, but we can connect virtually with them and have a, a very uh, compelling experience with their divers. So um, I think there's a place for bringing subject matter experts in there. And then of course, uh, famously, one of the uh, best use cases for this technology is classroom to classroom collaboration, where you can have folks in Australia uh, speaking to folks in Canada or maybe in the Middle East or elsewhere and uh, getting a cultural experience that they might not otherwise uh, been able to have. Yeah, 100%. The cultural things is a real deal. And there's always those snippets and unexpected wins that you get when you're connecting groups together. Absolutely. So uh, just curious, when you do collaborative programs, do you find it's a lot of effort to line these workshops, these things up with someone else's content? Or is it something that you go, you know what, we've got a UN observance day, let's just throw something together. I mean, I'm, what I'm thinking about is the, the CILC programs. The whereby you know, you've got these events, you know, spring into learning and fall back into fall or whatever the, all the different names are. I mean, is it difficult to put together these collaborative events? And that uh, probably would be even even better question for Tammy when she's on board. I'm, I have the privilege of just coming in as a kind of single subject matter expert in the marine sciences and uh, offering my expertise and uh, my scientists as experts for that topic. And so uh, here at Moat, we don't do a lot of those collaborative um opportunities, not as many as maybe we should, uh, because most of our effort is to come into the classroom and offer these kinds of what we call C-TREK experiences, uh, where we have an interactive program talking about uh, the areas that we study. And uh, we haven't yet had the opportunity to collaborate long-term with classrooms um, outside of the FLIP uh, Discovery Library. And uh, I know some content providers do offer that. Uh, early in our history, way back there with the ISDN days, we had a lot of content with our local schools, uh, but since then we've uh, diversified and we actually do more programming outside of Florida than we do inside, ironically enough. Do you do many programs at homeschoolers? Homeschoolers can tune in. Um, and one of the challenges, and this is uh, something I talked to Tammy about a lot at CILC, is uh, from a business, and, and you know a lot about the, the business side of things with this, uh, with your own company there, Ben. 
Uh, but one of the challenges is having an equitable fee structure that uh, compensates the content provider uh, while also giving a quality experience to the audience and making sure that it's affordable. And uh, so if you came on a bus and came out here for a uh, virtual or for a physical field trip, uh, you would pay the gate admission fee and uh, that's all a uh, normal part of it. But uh, people still don't always uh, accept the virtual experience as uh, something that is worth paying for. So that could be a challenge. And then also having a fee structure where we charge, do we charge for just a program and have a hundred people connect? Or is there a mechanism where we can charge each individual a ticket price? And so there's a couple of companies out there that are offering that. In fact, uh, that QR code that I showed you, let me go back to it uh, for um, the Goodnight Aquarium. Uh, we're working with a company called uh, On Zoom. It's kind of like the, the commercial side of Zoom where you can go in and uh, get uh, tutorials or uh, lessons, sometimes yoga lessons, language lessons. But if you scan that QR code, it should take you to a free offering that we're doing for Goodnight Aquarium. And so we're doing that, uh, what is April, uh, 27th uh, and on our calendar, probably the 28th on yours. And so that'll be the morning of the 28th. You can connect in for free and check that out. Uh, but we're using that on Zoom technology for homeschool groups and others where they can connect with us and, and pay a price per ticket, per participant, per connection instead of uh, per group, which uh, helps us out a lot and then makes these experiences more uh, uh, available and diversified for uh, a wider audience. I hope that all makes sense. No, it does. I mean, I think about on Zoom and the opportunities that it has for other software vendors, that it really is, for want of a better term, an arms race in capturing eyeballs. And I suppose in a lot of ways for um, everyone here. Now, I just see there, Karen has uh, jumped on in. You've got a question there. Oh, I was just going to also add to, um, to that as well. It's a conversation we've been having quite a lot in the last sort of 12 months about how to to, to deal with the individual learners. And we, we've seen in Australia a really large increase um, post-pandemic of students continuing to be homeschooled um, as opposed to going back to mainstream learning. So we, we've had that same conversation about how do we charge those individual tickets to give that equity of access for the kids that aren't in the classroom. So it's, it's interesting to see that that's something that's happening um, on a global scale um, as well. And Jason, what I wanted to also add is one of the key programs that we run throughout the year here in Australia is linking to some of those big national days. So, you know, we've got um, a big thing, Sea Week coming up. We do Coast Care Week. We do a lot of the marine ones. So um, it'll be really great to look at how we can actually do bigger collaborations, not just providing content from Australian providers um, to our schools, but also looking at some of the international ones. So do you have issues with different with the time zones? Like I know that you're after hours, um, or do you like the fact that you can do after hours because you've got the place to yourself? Yeah, it can be a challenge to uh, meet all the time zones. And so part of the reasons I uh, developed this good night at the aquarium is, again, the opportunity to get into the space while it's available to me, but also doing that with the thought that now it's more easily accessible to folks on the West Coast or even Hawaii, uh, or folks even over uh, around the other side of the ocean uh, from us in uh, Australia and elsewhere. Um, but yes, it can be a challenge, mostly for my family, uh, since I'm missing karate practice with my kid right now, but my wife was able to take him tonight. And um, also, um, um, making these more, uh, again, equitable and available to a wider audience by being uh, flexible uh, with the times. We try to do it whenever possible. Uh, we had a group up in Alaska that wanted to connect on a Saturday morning, uh, which is not normally a time that I come in, but fortunately one of my coworkers was here and she was able to run a solo show with the Girl Scouts up in Alaska and uh, do one of those See Me Read programs with them. They wanted to learn all about Eugenie Clark and I think they ended up actually knowing more about her than we did. <laughs> they, were, they were very well prepared. Um, excellent. Um, well, are there any other questions coming through? I know we've got a, a, a few different content providers. I was wondering whether anyone from uh, Reef HQ wanted to, to chat because I know you guys do a similar um, style connecting to your, um, your aquarium a bit offline at the moment because you're getting a new aquarium built. Yay. Yeah, good day, folks. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was great. Thanks, Jason. Um, where we use similar technology, but nowhere near as swish or as seamless as where you're able to stream. Um, I, I just wanted to to follow up on 
maybe some of the technology you're using there. We've just got a content or a uh, people on content view, but I suspect you're using a streaming platform, OBS or something similar. Would that be correct? Actually, it's not OBS, uh, but that would work uh, to provide these kind of effects. But what I'm actually using is a company, Blackmagic, and they make a small, relatively affordable video switcher called the ATEM um, Extreme. And it comes in a variety of sizes from uh, four inputs all the way up to eight. And I'm using the eight input uh, version of it. And uh, it's like your typical broadcast kind of switcher that you might have seen uh, historically, but in a much more miniaturized and relatively speaking, much more affordable package. And so the, the ATEM, uh, and then it also, of course, allows me to do the, uh, the green screen techniques and then also do the uh, uh, graphic overlays with just the push of the button. And uh, it works out pretty well. Very good. Well, we actually have some of that technology in our equipment rack, but we're putting it through the AMX system. So we've got a little switcher keypad um, touch screen that we use, but that's good to know. Thanks, Jason. And, and once again, really appreciated your presentation. Thank you. And yeah, great to hear that you're getting a new aquarium. And then here's a, another little demonstration of a, some more technology. I have this little foot pedal, which also allows me to switch between the slides and so I was able to step on my pedal just now and go from the picture to this little video of the new aquarium that we're going to be trying to offer at the end of next year. And I'm looking forward to bringing some virtual experiences out of this space to you all as well. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to that. I've just put on my bucket list that I might have to come across to do one of the adult learner uh, programs um, because I think it looked amazing. Um, excellent. Uh, are there any other questions popping up or any questions that we might have missed in the chat that you want to uh, uh, still get answered? Um, what we'll also be doing is some of the information about, you know, engagement um, ideas and technology. We will be, um, for all the registered participants, put it in our conference manual that we'll be sharing as well. So you might not have received this before from previous events, but it's a little bit of our secret tips and tricks. Um, of how to, you know, get the best out of your presentations. Uh, Jason, you wanted to add something? Do you have a question for us? I just had one more point I wanted to share, and I remembered to put it in at the chat just at the last minute, but that takelessons.com would be an interesting resource for your teachers to explore both independently if they want to offer online tutoring, uh, but now they're also opening it up to organizations like Moat to begin offering individual classes to groups or individuals and so they have, again, a lot of affordances on that website. And that's a, a company that Microsoft is uh, working with called Take Lessons. And uh, I'll be doing that Goodnight Aquarium with them tomorrow. They also have asynchronous video content available through their website too. So good thing to check out. Excellent. Well, I think we'll have to collate all of those really great links and um, put them uh, through the follow-up material as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think we're all inspired. It was a great way to start. Oh, we're fading out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, ben, do you want to jump back on? There we go. Why not? <laughs> Why not? All right. So look, uh, thank you so much again. And I cannot highly recommend enough if you can get yourself over to Florida to pop into the not just bug Jason, Jason's very much a great host. And there is a great hot dog place, by the way, just around the corner. If you are so inclined, they probably have vegetarian options, but I can tell you now the non-vegetarian options are very non-vegetarian. <laughs> anyway, little heads up on the side. I have to say, Ben, quite a lot of your exploring of the US, linking to your amazing experiences, connecting with uh, US content providers, always seems to have a food link. As well, I'm pretty sure you've talked about the chili, um, the Philly cheese steaks at some point as well. So um, obviously, it's a, a really good association there. Um, so that was a really fabulous way to start off. Um, I think we have we got Megan lined up, ready to go. I see that she. We absolutely do, and I'm going to go with that food link just a little bit more. <laughs> I got to hang out with Megan when I got to do a Churchill Fellowship. Oh gosh, nearly ten years ago now, out in Alberta, Canada. This place called Drumhella. And Megan took me out to go, I got to try poutine, proper poutine in Canada. But there you go. There's my food link, just working with you for a little bit, Karen. But anyway, I want you to introduce to Megan McLaughlin-White, who is a fantastic distance learning coordinator. She's been presenting distance learning for many, 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 many years. And uh, we, um, 
it's really a genuine privilege to find out just exactly what uh, what happens at the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology in Canada. It's an amazing space. If you ever get to go over there, it's well worth it. If you're a dinosaur nut, and even if you're not, it's still great to see. So I'm going to pass across to Megan. Hi there. Yes, we are here. Thank you so much for having us. And this is sort of our standard screen that uh, we'll have as uh, any of our uh, participants join our Zoom room. We usually program through Zoom uh, unless a uh, site requests that we, you know, join their Google meeting or Teams link and whatnot. So yeah, we have this. And so why don't we bring everyone over to Canada and wherever you are, how about everyone say, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> And hello, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's so nice to, to see everyone uh, there in Australia. And I think Jason's still watching. So hi, Jason. Uh, well, we're really excited to join in for your conference. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, before we get going, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Megan, and I'm the Distance Learning Coordinator here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology. And yeah, it was awesome. I got to host Ben, how many years ago now? Five or so? Oh, <laughs> gosh, 20, 2014. 2014. Oh, yeah, because I hadn't had kids yet. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess it's been a little while. Uh, but that was super exciting, and he did some great work collaborating, collaborating uh, with so many different partners to come up with some great VC and distance learning tips and tricks. And so we're here to talk a little bit about some of our, I guess, tips and tricks. Uh, but before we get into the, the nitty gritty, the session content, uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a an overview on the history of our distance learning department here at the museum, because, you know, looking at uh, where you came from helps to where you are now and maybe where you're going in the future. So we'll we'll jump in for a little bit of background. Um, for those of you, maybe you've never heard of us before and that's okay. The Royal Tyrrell Museum is Canada's largest museum devoted exclusively to the science of paleontology. That's right, that's all we have here. <laughs> Um, so we're one of the biggest in, we are the biggest in Canada and one of the biggest in the world. Uh, just last year in the 2022 calendar year, we had a record breaking season, I guess, or year, we had over 500,000 people come through our doors. So we had a great year um, in terms of visitation. Um, but it's kind of odd because as Ben knows, uh, Drumheller is kind of remote. <laughs> we are in the badlands of Alberta uh, in the western part of Canada. And to get here, it's about an hour and a half's drive from Calgary. That's our closest major city. So despite being remotely located, we do pretty well in terms of visitors. Um, but we know we, we wouldn't be able to share the museum with everyone. And I don't know, like you're having summer, right? <laughs> But here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's not so nice. This is actually what it looks like outside. We are in the middle of winter. It's snowy and cold. And as you can imagine, we don't have a lot of visitors right now. We have quite a cycle here. We have very uh, calm and uh, quiet winters at the museum and very busy summers. So, you know, it's beautiful to come here in the summer, but if you happen to be Canada in Canada in the winter, you know, you basically have the museum to yourself, which is pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, we realized that not everyone was going to be able to visit the museum. So we decided we wanted to bring the museum to everyone. And that's when we first created our distance learning uh, department and our programming. 
And we had to like, <laughs> uh, although we had great insight, we had to take an existing classroom and kind of make it into a studio space. Um, I'm curious, how many of you used to use Tamburgs or Cisco's or video conferencing units? Yeah, do you remember like the $20,000 chunks of equipment? Yeah, right here. <laughs> That's what we were using at the time. We had those big hardware solutions, um, cameras. What you can't see here is that there is a green screen, a big, big green sheet of paper. Um, this was before Amazon started shipping out all the, the great supplies. <laughs> and uh, we also, um, yeah, had our green screen and in the ceiling, we took out all the ceiling tiles and hung up lights uh, a little precariously. So with that success, uh, over 16 years, we've evolved into a studio space like this. About four years ago, the museum had a little expansion, uh, well, more like a $12 million expansion. And our um, studio, new studio was written right into the plans. So we got a fresh new studio all ready to go with, to get started again with distance learning. So it was great to jump into more of a, I guess, in a, in a way, a state of the art studio, but I guess it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So again, for a little background, we launched in 2006. Um, and since then, we've delivered over 4,300 programs to over 137,000 participants. That's approximate. <laughs> and uh, just last year, we hit about 30 different countries, which is pretty awesome. We can actually say that we are seeing people worldwide and sharing the museum, which is awesome. Uh, but then something happened two years ago, right? COVID. <laughs> and uh, as devastating as this was, uh, our department was one of the few that was able to come back to work. While the museum doors were closed, we were here uh, with lots of precautions and, and face masks actually being able to do our programming because as the teachers had to go teach online, well, they needed some content to help fill in their time online. And that's when our prog programs really jumped up. Um, prior to COVID, we would do about 228 programs a year. That was our average. And then for the last two years, we've averaged 500 a year. So that's how much, you know, with COVID, it, it allowed people to uh, have to get familiar with learning and teaching and using, you know, technologies like Zoom and uh, and Skype and Google Meets and and be creative in those ways. So I guess it helped us. I feel like we're gonna drop a little bit, but I'm sure we'll be a little bit higher than that number post, post COVID. All right, so now that we've had a little bit of a background to our programming that we've, we've been doing this for a while, uh, we've come up with some tricks and um, tips and uh, basically what we call the three eyes of engagement that we try to incorporate into our programming. It works for us and uh, hopefully it works for you. Um, maybe you can take some of these tips and tricks and you're probably already doing a lot of them. <laughs> let's be honest. So uh, without further hesitation, let's jump right into it. The three eyes of engagement. We are going to start with informative. Are you informative? What What's your information? Uh, what are you trying to teach about? And how much are you trying to teach? We're going to be talking about innovation. Are you innovative? How are you combining technology and teaching techniques to, to be different, to be creative, to be innovative? And then thirdly, of course, interactive, right? That's the most important, uh, I would say, for what we do is we have to be interactive. We, we, we're not a YouTube video that you put on. We are live. We are here. We're here to talk to you. So what are some different interactive techniques you can use to engage your audience? All right. So, yeah. Let's talk about it. We are coming to you live from a dinosaur museum, right? I mean, I'm at one of the, <laughs> I think, a great place to work. And my content is easy to talk about, right? Dinosaurs, fossils. I don't usually have a problem getting people excited for what I'm teaching about, but I have a clear idea of what I'm going to be teaching about. And for example, you know, it is a lot about dinosaurs. You probably recognize this dinosaur, right? Yeah, we've... If you know its name, go ahead and shout it out at home. Yeah, this of course is Triceratops. Uh, we find these here in Alberta. What you can't see about Triceratops from this is just how big a dinosaur this really was. The skull here alone was about the size of a smart car. 
And some of the biggest triceratopses could weigh as much as two African elephants. They were massive. Not only do we find triceratops in Alberta, there's 19 different types of ceratopsians. So there was more than of these dinosaurs with different arrangements of horns and frills. So there was just a little snapshot of some information that I was able to talk to you about, right? So again, it depends on where you're coming to, coming from. So um, the content, are you going to present? Are you going to do a lecture? Are you going to perform an experiment? Are you going to lead the class through a project? Um, maybe, again, an experiment or an art project? Are you going to be a multimedia interactive experience? Or are you immersive experience where you're getting the kids to role play or the site to role play? So that's kind of what you have to decide is what's the best way to take your information and, and uh, take it out to the world? What are you going to do in your, in your program? The next that we found extremely helpful is the majority of our sites are schools, right? So we do have curriculum connected programming, right, for specific grades. That was what we first started with. We had a, our first program was called Rockin' Alberta Resources, and it was for basically grades three and four here in Alberta. And you know what? That's still one of our most popular programs because the teachers know that they're gonna get something that's specifically uh, connected to their curriculum. Um, and again, information, uh, when we do programs and I'm connecting to Australia, I might do a little bit of research ahead of time as to what fossils you find in your area. Um, I know there's an amazing opalized pliosaur that's on display at the American or the Australian Museum, right? And we have some amazing marine reptiles. I've got the cast skull of uh, Nicosora and its flipper here. And these are marine reptiles, a type of plesiosaur that's sort of similar to what you find in Australia. So what I'll try to do is look up ahead of time where I'm connecting and what kind of fossils they may have because I might have to answer questions about them. Okay, you gotta go away, down you go. <laughs> and finally, uh, our next point is presenter. Uh, obviously, you're gonna have somebody hopefully leading your content, leading your lecture, your experiment. Um, do they have training in working on camera? Do you wanna go through some techniques on you know, eye contact with the camera, uh, energy, right? You probably realize that you have to bring a little more energy to your program in order to keep them engaged, right? So we want to have big energy. Uh, education, I mean, hopefully they can teach and learn about what you're talking about. Communication skills, those go with your coworkers and working with the sites that book your programs. Uh, rehearsing, and again, knowing your audience. So knowing your audience, if they're watching from abroad, if there's school groups, the grade, that will all help with what you're teaching about in the classroom. Um, we have a lot of programs that cross, they could be from kindergarten to grade 12, a general audience. We see libraries, we see retirement centers, hospitals. Oh man, the list goes on and on. <laughs> but what we can do is we can tailor the content for the, for the site. So for example, I'm coming to you live in the Badlands of Alberta. And the reason why we find so many fossils here is the Badlands. This area was carved out by glaciers. And because of that, it's carved down below into rocks that are about 70 million years old. They're from the late Cretaceous and they're chock full of fossils. So we often get the question, well, how do you find the fossils? How do you dig them up? Well, depending on our, our, our audience, we will have to vary the, the content and the delivery and the vocabulary we use, but we can use the same video, right? <laughs> it all starts when a keen-eyed paleontologist or a member of the public, such as yourselves, goes out for a hike in the Badlands. How do you find fossils? Well, all you need is your eyes. Looking for bits of bone marrow or grain, looking in the right spots, you might come across fragments. And those little pieces are like a breadcrumb trail leading to you, leading you to the bone in, the, in sight. Next, our team will have to pack up supplies in order to head out and start up the excavation or dinosaur dig. You have to like working outdoors. You have to like the sun, the bugs. <laughs> it can be pretty tough and pretty long of a hike to get to the site. From there, they'll set up camp and they'll start to excavate 
And unlike some of the movies, well, we'll have to slow, we like to slow down and go nice and slow. It's kind of like a crime scene, uncovering clues as we go, and we need to document the finds as we, as we go. So you can see something like this. We're gonna narrate through the video and the terminology I'm gonna use is gonna be dependent on my audience. I might up the, the uh, rock content if I know my site's learning about geology. Um, if I'm talking to kindergartens, I'm gonna use a little uh, a more excitement. So yeah, we can, we can do that in our programming. All right, the next I is innovative. Uh, so how, what are you going to do to make yourself stand out? Um, well, we always turn to technology, right? We're like, technology is how we innovate, right? What can we have to, to make ourselves look exciting? Um, what can we combine? So for example, we have computers. We have a, quite a few. We have three cameras in the studio. We use green screen, picture in picture. We're not at VR yet. Some of you might be working with VR. We're, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. But um, using a variety of techni technologies, and that that can be a double-edged sword, right? Because we knew our style was, you know, we have fossils; they don't move around. Uh, how are we going to bring them to life? Well, we wanted to have a high multimedia experience, doing lots of different things, and that would be a technology setup. And luckily, we have a great AV technician here at the museum. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I basically have a Jason working here. I'm not sure if he's still here, but I basically have a Jason that I turn to to help us with our technology within the studio. But that also can be a budget concern and uh, you also have to maintain it, right? So there's a fine line there. But we also want our site to have a good experience, right? So we need to help whoever booked the program make sure that they've tested their technology, they've got the room set up great, their cameras and, and microphone are working, that they're ready to go in the right way. And I'm sure some of you would know that pre-COVID, we had to do a lot more coaching, didn't we? <laughs> we had to help the teachers. Uh, even back in the Tamburg days, do you remember the H323 and all the digits you had to go in and how to work those old remotes? Well, we had to do a lot of hand-holding to get them going. Um, but now, now with since Zoom, you know, we've the world's kind of taught itself how to use a lot of this, which is awesome for us, isn't it? Um, so going along with innovation is your presentation style. Um, I said earlier that the three eyes, I, I'm going to go in a linear presentation, but they're all interconnected, right? These are all going to weave together to hopefully give you a great program. And again, presentation style kind of works with, again, how does it support your subject at your site? Science centers, places like that, they might want to do a lot of experiments. Are you just going to present your experiment? Or are you going to get the students to do an experiment? Does that mean the teacher has to get a lot of supplies? How much prep do they need? You have to make that easy for them, right? Um, zoos and aquariums, are you checking out some live animals? What happens if they're sleeping? You know, those kind of questions be ready for. Museums and art galleries, again, our subjects aren't moving around. They're pretty stationary. Like, how can we bring them to life? And again, for us, we wanted more of a multimedia immersive journey. So that's what we'll kind of turn to a little bit of a program demonstration again as to what we do here at the museum. I mean, we all started off with the quintessential field trip, right? Like the virtual visit. When you when you connect with the school, they're going to want to see your site. So you want to show off what you have. And that's, again, one of our programs we do for everybody. We tailor the information, the delivery style for that audience. And it's our virtual visit. The great benefits of connecting virtually is you get to play, uh, get to go to places that you wouldn't normally visit. So let's all head to Cretaceous, Alberta. Welcome to Cretaceous, Alberta. This is the first exhibit that you'll see here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, and it's meant to bring you into ancient Alberta about 70 million years ago. 
the environment would have been quite different. Of course, back then, they wouldn't have the cold winters we do today. It was warm and wet all year round. Think of places like Florida and Louis like where Jason lives, Louisiana, um, the Amazon rainforest. That's what ancient Alberta was like. We had so many evergreens, tree ferns. Um, the, this dried out riverbed would have been home to all kinds of amphibians and fish, reptiles running around, little teeny mammals, and of course, dominating the land. I mean, these things behind me, dinosaurs, right? Maybe you thought that these were T-Rex to begin with, but I gotta say, this is our favorite dinosaur at the museum, one called Albertosaurus. It's one of the, one that was, one of the ones that was first discovered by our museum's namesake, Joseph Bertirel. When he was climbing around the Badlands over 150 years ago looking for coal, he stumbled across the skull of this dinosaur. And basically, because it was the first scientifically discovered fossil and dinosaur from the area, they named it after the province of Alberta. And they are relatives to Tyrannosaurus rex, although not quite as big, but still pretty scary. I mean, look at that mouthful of razor sharp teeth. In fact, we should go in for a closer look at one. So I've got an overhead camera here that I can show you this tooth up nice and close. This tooth is an original fossil. You can see it's about as long as my finger, which isn't too shabby for a tooth. Now, if you have a look at the shape, what, what kind of animal do you think this is? Carnivore, herbivore, shout it out. Carnivore. Yeah. <laughs> That's ab absolutely correct. This is from a carnivorous dinosaur. We know that because it's pointy and it's super sharp. And these dinosaurs had a special feature or adaptation built right into that tooth. You can see that nice serrated edge, right? Those little bumps are kind of like the edge of a chainsaw. And it's on both sides of the tooth. <laughs> so a double-edged steak knife-like tooth ready to slice and dice. But it is a broken tooth, so dinosaurs had a special trick. Well, if a tooth broke, doesn't matter. Dinosaurs, like other reptiles, can grow and replace their teeth as needed. So no matter what, oh, lost a tooth, a new one would grow in. An adult Albertosaurus probably went through thousands of teeth in its lifetime. Now, what's great about this is that having my overhead camera here where I can zoom in on fossils allows us to take a closer look at the details of them almost better than we can see with the naked eye. So in just that little short excerpt of our virtual visit, um, as you can imagine, we go through galleries, we have videos connecting exhibits. In the exhibits, we can highlight um, features of the, the specimen that we're talking about, and we can go through different science concepts depending on the site that we're connecting to. So we vary, uh, again, the images, the videos, the fossils throughout the tour to keep them going. And, uh, you know, because as you probably guessed it, I'm not alone in the studio, I thought we'd break the fourth wall and reveal a little bit of studio magic here like Jason did earlier. <laughs> and uh, again, we saw a picture of this, but I'm at my little fossil station. I've got my overhead camera. I've got my main camera ahead of me. But then over here, we also have kind of our green screen or blue screen section where we can stand in front of the digital content. And of course, I have a helper in the studio. It's my coworker whose uh, name is Clement. So he's gonna swing the other camera over to himself and say, hello, there's Clem. He's got all of our fancy technology here too. Like Jason, we have our own mixer. This one's been actually going for, I think seven or eight years. Um, I can tell you more about it later, uh, but yeah, he can work the controls and by allowing him to focus on the technology, it allows me to focus on my presentation so that I can continually watch the students, interact with them, bring the energy, and I don't have to worry about pressing buttons. And we knew early on that that was gonna be our strategy, that not all sites would be able to do this, but that was what we thought we would wanna do. This sort of was inspired by like, if you can stop the news anchor, you know that the news anchor's not alone, they're working with people in their studio, and that's kind of what we wanted. And speaking of in the studio, we also have fun props. We have our own dinosaur in the studio. Um, in, in the chat, if you're there, you can feel free to tell us what kind of dinosaur you think this is. Any guesses as to what kind of dino this is? I'll let you type that. Or if anybody wants to, I'm not sure. I wasn't able to join early because of 
um, commitments, but if anybody wants to shout out the, the dyno, you're welcome to do that too. I'll give you a hint though, it's, maybe that makes it too easy. <laughs> we'll see if we have any answers in the chat. But yeah, so again, while I was having Clem distract you or Clem was distracting you, I was able to pull my friend off into the space. And we do that in a few of our programs where we are able to bring this guy out and talk about dinosaurs. Yeah, this is a dinosaur called Dromaeosaurus albertensis, better not yet known as a raptor. So if you remember Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, this one is, uh, yeah, like kind of cousin to Velociraptor, although Velociraptor was found in Mongolia, not the United States. And it's actually smaller. The real specimen is smaller than this guy. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. We can do lots of fun things like that. So again, that goes with innovation and you have to decide if that's what you want to do, if that's your, what your style is going to do to work best with your technologies. All right, so we're just going to reset here for a moment. I'm going to go push my dyno back. And we'll move on to the last eye that we're going to bring up. Of course, the last eye is going to be interactive and that's probably the main difference that we're doing here um, again if we weren't interactive we would be a youtube video so we want to be more than that um, our style is to be heavily visually interactive using a combination of images videos animations um, we had the extra cameras so that I have two places I'm working. I have my overhead camera to bring the fossils in close up. Um, for text, I have to say, when putting this presentation together for you, this is way more text than we normally have in our program. So just so you know, we don't do a lot of PowerPoint style programs. No, no, no. This is just for you and for me to help me organize my thoughts. But yeah, we don't put a lot of text up there. It's all about responding and, and working with your audience. So again, in addition to a variety of visuals, we have a variety of responses that we ask of the audience. Um, so it depends. Some of our programs are team-based programs where the students work together in groups and they try to get points, which is pretty fun. We have lots of little mini games to break up some of our programs, right? Kids love games and so do grown-ups. <laughs> um, we have shout out the answer. So a couple of times I asked you to shout out the name of a dinosaur, right? Remember? Triceratops. Um, even if I can't hear you, I'm going to assume that you probably said Triceratops or you're thinking it. I asked you to shout out what kind of dinosaur uh, is this tooth from carnivore herbivore and you shouted out carnivore right so just those little moments are ways to keep your audience engaged. For the little ones we have movement breaks right we're like okay we can see them getting wiggly and jiggly let's stand them up let's get them moving around so that we can refocus them. And we have little quizzes and voting moments where we might ask them um, a, um, a, qu a quiz question. That works when you can see your audience, right? And that's a lot of the times what we have. But again, post-COVID, it seems like we were doing more webcasts, so we might not be able to see our audience. So for those, we can go to poll questions. Here at the museum and our programs, we often start off with the question, what is paleontology, right? Because I think you have an, a notion of it. And I can get you to help me answer. Here, we'll go back. I'll get you to help me answer that question in a couple of different ways. Sometimes I ask the class, what is paleontology? Who out there wants to raise their hand and tell me? And I'll choose a friend. So I might choose an audience member. Or if it's a group, I might say, what is paleontology? A lot of kids tell me it's the study of dinosaurs. What do you think? Is it only dinosaurs? Yes or no? And I'll wait for their answer. Again, if I can't see them, I might go to a poll question. So I might say, what is paleontology? The study of, I'll give some possibilities, dinosaurs, ancient life, blah, blah, blah. Let's launch a Zoom poll and see what you think. And I, I didn't have enough foresight to send, Zoom, to, to send Ben and Karen the Zoom poll ahead of time. But I don't, I'm sure you've been in a Zoom meeting where hopefully you're engaged, but you know, when that poll comes up, it's fun to answer, right? So we often, if we're doing a webcast, we will uh, put up a Zoom poll to have our audience interact with us. And yes, Ben, you are correct. It is ancient life. <laughs> so there's that. And our programs will always end with a with a designated question and answer period. Um, hopefully 10 minutes, 
um, five to 10 minutes we like to set aside for Q&A because again, that is what, what we're doing for our site is we are the expert, they're coming to us. And so that's what we wanna make sure is we give them the opportunity to ask us questions or even just share with them some of their fun facts or or sometimes they've got stories about fossils and, and sometimes they just want to tell somebody that and that's awesome so i wanted to do a little bit with that of course i wanted to end the session in a question and answer period so you're welcome to ask me questions about you know what we do in the technology but i also challenge you what we like to do here because i have the um i'm lucky to have a co-pilot here i'm lucky to have a technician our strategy when we do question and answers is uh, if I can answer it using fossils, I will, because, you know, what's better than seeing a cool fossil up close? Or we also have Clem standing by to help support me with my answers. Because I have him, I can, you know, someone asks a question about T-Rex, I can throw up a T-Rex. And we try to do it as fast as possible so that the kids are like, what? How, how, did, how did they know? <laughs> how did they know what I was going to answer? So um, I'm not sure how you were doing this earlier. It sounded like some people were talking. Um, some people were maybe typing questions, so if you want, go ahead, if you want to type in questions for us, you can, or if you want to ask live, we can take some questions uh, at this time. Well, first, and I you can so. hear my, my, my throat, my voice is a little, uh, I've been fighting, a, not fighting anything, but just getting my voice back, so part of me. Oh, it's an occupational habit hazard for every one of mm -hmm. us here. Uh, thanks so much, Megan, yeah. and Clem, uh, powering behind the scenes for this session. Uh, absolutely. Now, we did actually have a question uh, in, that's buried in the chat there was about how you are oh. seeing your audience. How are you seeing them? Yeah. Is there a massive screen behind Clem? Like, where is it? <laughs> yeah, it's we. I don't know if we can spin the camera around that far. Well, we'll see what we can do for you. But yeah, absolutely. I have basically a double set and we were able to afford when we had our expansion, we budgeted into the expansion all new technology and then our previous monitors we have them there's clam so can you oh yeah behind him on the wall i don't know if the camera can go up oh yeah 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 here goes nice we've never been well i think we've been asked this but we just never took <laughs> we never answered so there you can see double double screens and i'll come over and just show you or clem can this uh here you go this is um a screen and the camera is hanging right here so that when i look at the camera i can see what i'm presenting and where i'm looking so it all is together and then over here is um a feed to the computer so i can see where's the no, i'm not used to this over oh, it's over here <laughs> um so i can see uh what uh clem's bringing up and then as you can see you guys are down here you're down on the wall and there's another screen over there so yeah we have I don't know, what are these 70, 65 or 70 inch monitors? Two of them back there? I think they're 65s. I think the remote says 65. <laughs> so a, a lot of uni strut <laughs> at the top of that top of that roof there. Well, I'm trying to show us some of our cameras. That's one of our PTZ pan tilt zoom cameras. Oh, and they're gonna look at each other. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Oh, you're trying to look to the other feed. It's okay. Let's see. We have the we have a little um uh, and then you went to, yeah, we have a little uh, Hubble cam that allows us to string and, and go to different presets. So yeah, we are seeing you on big screens. So I look here, I'm looking at the camera and I can just drop my eyes down to see you. And then when I'm on the green screen, I have the other camera and another monitor so I can just look down to see my audience. So that hopefully that eye contact is so important, right? Like, you know, when someone's looking down, you just don't feel that connection. So that's why we ha I have the camera hanging literally in front of my my feed so that I'm maintaining that eye contact. Uh, that was um, impressive. <laughs> I'll let okay. you see the chat. Yeah, we chat. were very excited. Hey, I got to say, we had this expansion. We budgeted in the equipment. We were so lucky because then uh, our government change, our provincial government changed, and then COVID happened, and now there's no money, right? So we just lucked out. And luckily, our previous monitors, our technician, like I said, I have an amazing AV technician, shout out to Ken. And uh, we have those spare monitors tucked in the back. We have a couple of spare cameras. So like we, if something fails, at least we have a backup for the most part. And so that was that was really awesome that we were able to to get the funding at that time about four years ago for this expansion. 
Now, um, when I got to visit you, I, know, I noticed I was having a look over the programs that you're running and you're still running one of the programs I got to see years ago, PIQ, Test Your Paleo <laughs> Intelligence. It's so yeah. cool. Can you let us know a bit of how you run that thing? Because I, I thought- Oh yeah, and what's hand. funny is that we are gonna, we're upgrading that program. So I know it's it's one that we don't, a program called Discovering Dinosaurs because it's for the same young audience. Um, kind of takes the place of PIQ. It used to be more popular, uh, but PIQ, it's got a complicated title and it's a flash program. We're converting it. So it's going to be called T-Rex Rescue. And it, it's so old. It was so old. It's still a standard definition, but we have a, we have a way to change the... <laughs> change the setup but we just don't have time right now but yeah it's so old but it's so cute and we have this volcano and the this is one of our team working programs so the kids are working in their dinosaurs they're helping them jump off the volcano because you never know when that volcano might end press end oh maybe not <laughs> when you never know that volcano might erupt and so we have uh, various mini games uh, there it goes there's our volcano erupting and uh, yeah, we play little games with the kids and uh, we'll leave it up. Did you want us to actually demonstrate a little game or just show that part? No, I was just curious. I mean, yeah. one of the things that well, um, grabbed my attention yeah. was really just how it's interactive. So each one's a team. Yeah. If they're the orange yeah. and yellow dinosaur, down they go. Yeah, and so now we've got, we're, we're, re, we're redoing it finally. Um, it's called T-Rex Rescue. They're going to help some T-Rexes down. But what we found is that the kindergartners, I don't know if it, if you call those year ones or preschoolers, they, 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 we wanted them to be in little teams, but sometimes they need a little more coaching. So now we're going to have them be in a super team. They're going to help the dinosaurs down and that will be good. And then grades for us one and two, they're going to be again in their little teams, helping down some T-Rexes. And so we're retitling it because PIQ, Test Your Paleo Intelligence, is a long title where, you know, who knows what it means. And <laughs> now you know that you're going to rescue some T-Rexes and we're going to play lots of little games. It's super interactive. And again, we're going to have a couple of versions. We've started moving to actually a lot of little PowerPoints to, to use our content. I mean, it's got some good features and we're working with that for now um, to help with the content. My previous person who was in one of the first pictures, Colin, he was able to program and build stuff in Flash. Um, but it, of course, we know Flash is um, pretty much extinct. <laughs> so, and it's hard to um, it's hard to tweak a lot of that. And now you can do a lot of that in simple stuff like you know little things like PowerPoint. And um, we also have so we we took the success of PIQ, the team building success. We created Planet Earth. So I don't know if you saw that on our website, but the 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 this is for grade seven and up. And they'll they'll be working in teams again. We go through basically the history of the Earth and uh, some different concepts. And they have different rounds. Like we have a question period for the Precambrian. How old is our planet? And we made this one because um, we this one kind of launched during COVID. So in case they were at their individual houses, you know, like and they weren't able to work in teams, they could just put in the chat the number or we could bring up some Zoom polls. So I know you probably had to do this too, Ben, like when it was COVID times and all the kids were at their houses, like uh, trying to manage that group. And I know it all took us a little while and so the teachers, but then you kind of remember the little strategies to that would help you flow through the program. So yeah, we 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 find this program hits our grade seven curriculum really well for us here in Canada. Um, and it's all in a PowerPoint and there's little animations you can do and we're just still figuring it out. But, <laughs> and luckily we just got a, a new designer here at the museum. We're really lucky. Our museum has an in-house design department. So a lot of our content, our, all of the stuff you see has to go through our design department. And uh, now our new guy is an animator. So we're going to have some cool animation stuff and we're working on a program called Dinosaur Showdown. That's the working title. Guess what's going to happen? Yep. Dinosaurs are going to. <laughs> it's gonna like if you have two two tied dinosaurs and they fight each other um that's what's gonna happen but we're gonna have some 3d animation and we're gonna have the audience uh based on fossils predict the outcome of the fight as it were so yeah this is so cool awesome and one of the things i noticed is that you also do work in bilingual programs how does that run yeah 
Uh, well, that would be Clement's department. Um, we just have French right now, or um, we have connected with a few different sites um, that we would have you know, basically an interpreter that's able to um, help us to, or yeah, interpreter that can work with us. Um, as you can see, the closed captioning is on. So, you know, now nowadays, anybody that's deaf and hard of hearing can put the closed captions on. And although I'm not sure how it works for some of, like for you, um, some of the paleontology terms and dinosaur names get a little bit, <laughs> get a little bit twisted there. But um, yeah, so Clement luckily is bilingual. So I will actually tech for him and we have here, he's actually just bringing up, we have a program called Plonger dans la Paléontologie. So this is a program that's all in French. And, um, you know, qu'est-ce que c'est? Qu'est-ce que c'est la Paléontologie? What is, what is Paléontologie? Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not bilingual. I did, I did take some French, but I, I, I can actually, I'm learning more as I hear him talk. I'm like, oh, I know what they asked this time. So, yeah, we're able to do some bilingual programming, or we often connect to um, a colleague in Japan and she will, we have to take out a lot of content because I will speak and then she will interpret. But yeah, we can make it work in that way too. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm just actually curious, I mean, yeah, in virtual land, cyber land, please ask your questions. Megan's got a lot of background. I know. That's and, okay. so and I wanted to I wanted to show off like, does no one have any burning dinosaur questions they want to ask? You know? Well, I know, know a particular about... there's actually uh is there, she's still here. Uh, there, I feel like I'm picking on you, Naomi. We have two Naomi's <laughs> in the audience. One Naomi is from the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum in central oh, Queensland. Yeah. They do an amazing job. Uh so uh I know the Naomi. Uh, Do they have, they have live programs? We should, we should, we should have each other or check out each other's programs. So let's see how we talk about dinosaurs and stuff. Um, I think that sounds amazing. Why Naomi um, comes in with her question, Ben? I just realised that two of my favourite topics in the world that I do a lot of my presentations on are marine life in Australia and also Australian dinosaurs and rocks and fossils. So, did you do this? Make this conference just for me, Ben? Oh, I, I did, Karen. Like we, yeah. <laughs> Karen, <laughs> Karen, what's your favorite dinosaur? Uh, well, my favorite dinosaur is an Australian dinosaur called Mataburrosaurus. Yeah. And so for us, we would, yeah, we have our co a cousin. I have basically its cousin's fossil right here. Um, a hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur, right? So one of its cousins would be one of the big duck-billed dinosaurs like this Edmontosaurus, which this skull is almost not quite to life size, but this dinosaur is bigger than T-Rex, right? And so we have 14 different species of duck-billed dinosaurs um, found in Alberta. So I've got Carithosaurus here, and then you got a few of them back here. Someone, you might like Parasaurolophus, right? With its big crest on its head, um, Lambiosaurus. Yeah, so we have our cousins, uh, of course, different kinds of dinosaurs. Our North American dinosaurs evolved their own kind over here. So we only have T-Rexes, or T-Rex is only found in our section, as well as Triceratops. But of course, Australia has some of their amazing dinosaurs too. I want to go to Dinosaur Cove. I want to come to Dinosaur the, to, to Australia and explore Dinosaur Cove and all that. Well, uh, Naomi's having some fun in the chat there. Uh, and um, there's okay. an informal question and a formal question, but mm. one's fun. So first one, because you want to talk dinosaurs. So would Australovenator or Albertosaurus win? That's a bit of a call. Yeah. I love it. Well, I'll, I don't know if we have a picture a picture of Australovenator, but Albertosaurus is bigger, so it's it's going to win. <laughs> oh, Australia versus Canada. This is what it's about. So this is... This is a jaw of a smaller Albertosaurus. So this is the this is the cast. That's why I can hold it like this. So this is a jaw of this one. I don't know. Do we have a picture of this dinosaur in our collections? We try to have all images copyright of the museum, or we've asked for the artist's permission. So I don't know if we have that in our Fair imagery. Enough. And Naomi, if you're if you're listening in the background, if you feel if you want to unmute your video and share Australovenator Wintonensis, oh yeah, you're welcome to. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, oh Australovenator was built like a boxer. It. This is becoming a showdown. <laughs> there um, you go. Well, we can we can make that program happen. We'll have it a virtual fight between the two. <laughs> oh, well, we have. 
I was just going to say I love for maybe next year for our later this year for our Earth Science Week maybe we'll have a bit of a North American um, and Australian collaboration on on dinosaurs because um, we get a lot of our kids here don't know how many Australian dinosaurs we've got and know of course T Rex and those kinds of things so I reckon that could be a great program that could be a win for um, for for both audiences. Sounds great. Yeah, Absolutely. we have a program. Actually... We have. Yeah, go ahead. I just said this actually ties in with what Naomi's formal question, which is how do you roll out a program? How do we roll out a program? Um, we have an in-house ed education department and we we basically start off with, you know, what program justification, what what do we want to do and why? What is it going to, what curriculum outcomes or what audience is it going to hit? Um, so one, the two that we're revamping are already existing, um, but right now we've got in development um, a program called Masters of Flight um, because flight and aerodynamics is often talked about. So how can we look at fossil extinct creatures and talk about how creatures like pterosaurs flew um, and how did plesiosaurs fly underwater, right? So talking about different concepts related to flight and aerodynamics. And so that was because that was something addressed in the curriculum that is tricky and we wanted to supplement. We, again, we found some good uh, success with very specifically linked cur uh, curriculum outcomes. So that was one justification for that program. Dinosaur Showdown, we just, we want a dinosaur fighting program. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be able, we love like, uh, Glenn loves anime, we love Street Fighter, no, just kidding. <laughs> but like, love dinosaurs. So how can we bring, but how can we like, bring the science to that and talk to what would actually happen, right? So, but I, so yeah, I, yeah, fossil evidence, bite marks, things like that. And I imagine- so I don't think that- that's, I, I get don't know if that answers the question. But. Yeah, I think so. I get it a lot here about, you know, who would win between a shark and a crocodile. And so it's something that kids innately want to know that question. Yeah. If there's two things, who's going to be the top? So I think that idea of that sort of uh, fight um, will be something that the kids absolutely love. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Um, it's been great to have you on board and I can see some really wonderful collaborations Um into the future for 2023. Um, unfortunately, we have our next speaker. That's of course. Just so yeah. thank you so much. Um, we will put your contact details in our follow-up information as well. So um, just be ready for some um, excited people coming to. Um, yeah, I want to say hi to Bonnie because it's been a while, but I used to work with Bonnie. She used to book a lot of programs with us. So hi, Bonnie. <laughs> nice to see you two out there. Yeah, and uh, Ben and Karen have our, our um contact information if you want to reach out and ask questions we can continue this on another zoom call on your own time or like you know outside of this so feel free to reach out and uh yeah since co you know now we have a little more time since things are coasting after covid right so but thank you so much for in um inviting us we had a blast and we hope to see you down the road so on behalf of clement and myself megan we will sign off for now bye thank you wonderful to have you guys um excellent well we um that was a fabulous conversation and i just need to thank ben for organizing um all of our fabulous speakers so far and i do feel like it was a special treat um for some of the topic areas that i absolutely love um we're quickly going to go now to tammy from cilc the center for interactive learning and collaboration who's going to talk about some of the, the north american opportunities um to connect so both ben and i um, certainly Jason and Megan have all done programs. I think Reef HQ is as well, um, done program listed with CILC. So it's another opportunity for you to get your content to a different audience. Um, and yeah, I'll pass over to you now, Tammy. Thanks so much. Thank you, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining me. And thank you, Ben, of course, for inviting me um, to be a part of this wonderful event. So um, like Karen said, my name is Tammy. Um, to be officially introduced, I should be a formal Tammy Maureen. I'm with the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. I'm the Director of Member Relations. It's a fancy way I like to say of I get to work with 200 amazing content providers like Ben, Karen, Megan, Craig from Reef HQ. I also get to work with Jason at Home Marine Laboratory. Um, who provide amazing programming to our members from around the world. So CILC has um, 
55,000 lifetime members, 90% of them are the K-12 audience, and then uh, 5% to 7%, which is an increasing number lately, is lifelong learners, so those that we consider 55 and plus, and then we also have community members from around the world who are in libraries, scout groups, and intergenerational um, kind of groups that are coming together. So we've been around since 1994 as a nonprofit, and our main goal, like I said, is to connect those two great groups that I get to work with together to find amazing programming that we have on CILC. Um, so just kind of talked a little bit more about um, how um, CILC works and the great opportunities there is. Um, we have content providers um, at many different levels come into us at CILC and they're allowed to put their programming up and out there for members to join. Membership is absolutely free. So I'm going to go ahead and pop up our CILC website and please go ahead and put in any wonderful questions you have. And I apologize if you hear any background noise, it's evening here. So my house is a little bit busy right now. Um, so I do apologize if you're screaming in the background, but um, you'll see the CILC website here. Membership is absolutely free. So at the very top where it says my dashboard, you can click on, it should say join now. It takes about 45 seconds to um, a minute and a half to fill it out. And I, I know that for sure because I've timed people. But um, one of the ways we usually say to get started or to get a feel of what's out there on the CILC website is to do a program search. So I'm going to go ahead and pop up um, a search. I'm just going to do World War II since that's a really general topic that uh, many places, no matter where you are, talk about. So if I go ahead and hit enter, you're going to go ahead and see the amazing programs that come up. But every content provider on the CILC website is going to put um, this a content provider bio and a flyer together of the amazing programs they have. So if I scroll down here, I'll see the National World War II Museum, and I'm going to click on their program, Los Veteranos Latinos in World War II. So if I click on that, I'll open it up in a new tab. But if I check that out you'll see um, uh, this program flyer that provides some amazing information about the program itself. They'll go into the details. They have an opportunity to talk about if they have any offerings. So this particular one, since um, it's National Hispanic Heritage Month, is in September, mid-September to mid-October. Mid they provide it for free. Has some basic information about cost. And then at the very bottom, um, we have all of our Kavant to providers. There's a bio, and I'll show you that a little bit more so you can learn more about them. But we have them call out the format, so an outline of everything they're going to be covering. Um, objectives are what those students are going to be walking away with. And of course, any standards that aligns to. I know Megan was talking just before about the process for when they create programs. <clears throat> They look at the exact standards, and we call those out on the CILC website. So both the content providers can see what others have done, but also that educators can see the amazing um, standards that all of these programs hit. Um, now, as individuals in Australia, of course, you have different standards, but all great educators can look at a basic standard and then be able to tailor that to how it connects to the curriculum. So um, we usually say if you do your local standards um, and you look at it over, people will be able to see that and educators can transfer it over as many of you are able to do. Um, so I wanna go ahead and click up here because I'm gonna show you the National World War II Museum's content provider bio, but that's a little bit of a program flyer. And then I'm gonna go ahead and look at their bio, I just scrolled it down. But on every content provider bio, you'll see some amazing information about the content provider that's out there. So you can learn more about the National World War II Museum and what their organization is like. And then down at the bottom, it's gonna show all the amazing programs that they have to offer. So if you're intrigued by one, you can do the you know rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole, and keep on clicking and clicking and clicking as you get further down. But you'll see the amazing programs they have. And I also like to always point out at this time, as at the top right of our content provider bio pages is this Pinnacle Award emblem. So CILC 
I very much wants to hear from all of our members about how every program did. And so if you're looking to find programs and don't know a starting place or how to get going or looking at those things, um, we do look at evaluations. And so um, after a program is booked on the CILC website, a link is sent out an evaluation um, tailors, um, sorry, an evaluation is sent out, all the results come in and CILC gives a pinnacle award to our top content providers. And you can see some of the amazing, um, how many years a content provider has won um, and they'll look at things. You can also find that right here with the pinnacle award with that. But those are just kind of some basic things about CILC, um, the programming out there, what it looks like for the different people that are out there. But I wanna make sure I answer um, questions that you all have. So definitely put things in the chat or Ben, if you're Karen, if you know of any questions that people may have sent ahead of time, I'll be more than happy to answer them. But I wanna make sure I abide by your schedule and think of all that too. The one thing I might ask um, is for the, for really on the logistical side, how do you handle time and date conversion? That's a great question. So the, <laughs> and I should have picked that off right away because we were just talking about thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. CILC website has time conversion already built in it. So when a program is requested, you say you are in this time zone and it converts over to a content provider and pulls it up in their time zone. So there's no going onto Google or the international clock and trying to figure it out. I know Ben's really good about it, but I myself am horrible. I also, in America, we follow daylight savings time and some people don't follow that amazing thing. So it makes it tricky, but the CILC website Cree does that all for you and everything you see is time centric. So you could be self, um, self-centered during while your experience on CILC and definitely um, being, have it be known that you are in your time zone correctly. Yes, and you will too at the send of school. Yes, Ben put a wonderful tool in for there with the date and time clock, it's important. But on the CILC website, it's all set up for you to be able to put everything in your time zone and every request that comes in or it goes out is set up in that time zone that you're affiliated with. Excellent. And while we wait for um, see if there are any other questions come through, it's a really good opportunity to go and have a look on the CILC uh, website because there might be organisations and events coming up that you hadn't thought that you could connect with. Um, you know, when they're you know international collaboration, um, just ideas as well about your programming and you know different people that you might want to talk to. Um, as well. So I think there's so much that you can do. And you've got your fabulous festivals as well that have been really great the last couple of years. Yes, those have been a hit. CILC um, provides two opportunities for people to kind of get like a taste test or jump into programming. If you don't want to do a, if they don't want to do a search and book a program directly right away, they can go under, under our educators field. There's community of learning and digital learning festivals. And then we have um, tailored programming for our lifelong learners called Rome for Home. It's at a set date and time. We provide programming at 1 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So today I got to not only travel to all of you um, in the great down under, but I also got to go to the um, Alaska to Denali National Park um, to the tallest mountain in North America for our programming with our community of learning event. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any other questions that have come through, Ben? Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. Excellent. Well, Tammy, thank you so much for joining us. We will be sharing all of the uh, links to you and to the CILC website and really appreciate you taking out um, time in your evening to, um, to drop in and give us that information. So thank you. No problem. Thank you all for helping me. Um, as Karen just said, reach out to her and Ben will provide you with all my contact information. And I'm more than happy to work with any of you in any capacity that I can to help out and spread the word about how amazing distance learning is and the opportunities that are out there. Excellent. Thank you. See you later. Thanks so much. Great. Um, what we have next, sorry, I'm just trying to 
stop sharing sharing the screen. Uh, it's not letting me do it. So just bear with me. Uh, Tammy, can you unstop sharing? That's okay. Thank you. Yes, sometimes I can take over and sometimes I can't. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce you now to Bonnie Track. So um, many of you will have met Bonnie before. Um, Bonnie is from Dart Learning, um, part of the New South Wales Department of Education, and has, well, she got me started. Um, so we can blame Bonnie for all of this. She's probably um, helped us, a lot of us on our journey. And I think today um, Bonnie's going to share some of the sort of big picture insights of what's happening um, at the moment and what a little bit of the what we need to be looking forward to um, this year and beyond. So um, no pressure, Bonnie. Do we have your audio? You do now. Excellent. Uh, the technical glitches. Hmm. No. When you think they're all gone, it was so good to hear Jason talk about the old technology and Meg as well. You know, we've all lived it. We used to talk about the old ISDN where you could tell they've got eyes and a mouth, but that's about it. So, um, yeah, here we go. And really great to actually sit and watch some of these programs and see how clever these presenters are um you know when you're used to being behind the camera like i am and i watch people present i think oh they do it so effortlessly and and i know that so many of you have some you do have the backup of technical people but you also are one man bands and i do take my hat off to you because it's a big job that you do so uh, yes that learning's job is to get your content out there to the schools. So we look at it like we have two jobs. The jobs is to make it easy for teachers to find things and to find an audience for you. So uh, I will go ahead and keep moving through my presentation here. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, nearly two decades. Isn't that funny, Karen, when you think how long it's been that Dart Learning have been collaborating with content providers to offer teachers, parents, and students incredible educational virtual excursions, your virtual excursion. We have an experienced team, that's a nice way of saying we're old and been doing this for a long time, to assist you with the digital online production. So we do a lot of that sort of stuff as well. And the marketing, which we've really stepped into that area of marketing the content that you have, as well as quality of um, assurance across your virtual excursions listings that are on Dart Learning. So I will also take this time to uh, introduce Leanne Stone, who's been working with Jacob Nankerville and I for the past year, as well as Jan, who have really taken on that quality assurance and really made a difference to the way our website looks and makes the job easier for new content providers when they start coming on board with us to help them get their content out there. Thank you very much, Leanne, for all you're doing with us and whipping us into line with details. And the other thing is, of course, this is the one searchable website with the flexible delivery of events that can be specific to the learning objectives of the teacher's class and the professional learning of teachers. We figure that searchable is the most important thing when it comes to stuff for the teachers because they need to be able to find things quickly. So Karen and Ben asked me to talk today about trends. So normally what I do is talk a little bit about 2022 and where we're going with 23. So I'll look today at the data the teachers and what's in the future for 2023. Um, something you've all kind of heard from me before, but here we go looking at what happened last year. So last year we had 3,870 virtual excursions have been listed on Dart Learning. Um, we've had 7,500 teachers with 335,000 students participated in Dart Learning virtual excursions. And that is in as we mentioned before, our website's very flexible, allowing our providers to use your own booking system. So 48% of our providers still use your own booking system. So those figures are fantastic. So if you take the blip out that was 2021, when every, you know, trucking along 2021 and then back down to normal, when we did 100,000 students pretty much per annum, the fact that we're now tripling the amount of students that are participating 
as well as taking into consideration that extra 48% is pretty amazing. So we're really happy with the fact we are getting a lot of coverage for the events that are listed on Dartmoor. Uh, we have doubled the number of content providers. So we've gone from 100 and, from 70 to 150. So that's really great because the thing that we're selling to the teachers is we're the gold standard for finding your content. So um, the fact they know that they can come to Dart Learning and find all kinds of different content in one spot makes it really easy. That's, so that's great that the word's getting out there with content providers, that it's a good spot to be. 850 live virtual excursions were offered last year. So that's just the live stuff, not the actual um, on demand, which is massive as well. So we're really great because at the end of the day, listening to Meg talk and Jason speak as well, that interactivity is invaluable when it comes to virtual excursions. Unfortunately, it's not always achievable for what teachers need, but it is uh, invaluable to have those live and interactive events. How's this one? My favourite, 3,632,909 Facebook impressions, which is up 793%. Please don't expect to see those figures again, but that's fantastic considering that we had 2021. This is 2022 that we're talking about now. So what that means is our digital marketing plan is really working and it really is getting coverage for um, our content providers and getting the message out to the teachers. I'm having trouble with the ball. It's going forwards, backwards. Anyway, we did 50 targeted email campaigns across 27,000 different subscribers so what that means we're targeting those we're not just sending one email out to everyone which is what we used to do but these days we're going okay let's send one to the um, stage one and stage two teachers let's send it out to our science teachers let's send it out so that we're doing a lot more targeted marketing which makes a big difference too and we did 316 social media posts um, shared across various platforms including Facebook Instagram LinkedIn and within the department, that's Yammer and Teams as well. So the department has restructured uh, how they do the delivery of information. And Microsoft Teams is now a huge player within the department. So we have set up curriculum, maths, curriculum, English, secondary, primary, regional, remote. With those particular teams, it makes it easy for us to, to put notices in there and help get the audience for you. Okay. The teachers, I mentioned before about live events, how many we're offering. We have currently 67% of our excursions are on demand. And this is so good because we do get requests quite regularly from our teachers to say, we want to have stuff available all the time. Sometimes the dedicated times, as you know, don't actually fit in with the teacher's day-to-day um, -day programming, whether there's little lunch on or little lunch recess lunchtime fruit break whatever they happen to have so on demand is really important for them the other thing is depending on the time of year so if an event is left at, um, a virtual excursion is left as on demand afterwards then that means the teacher can program it into their curriculum and still have that resource available to them because they may not be covering certain topics at a certain time the old elusive secondary school, always hard to find, but with on demand, we're just finding we're getting a lot more uptake from secondary as well, because they can go and watch those when the teacher actually has the students in front of them. All of you are doing it. We don't need to talk to you about incorporating your pre-record stuff because watching even from today, and I know what you do, you do incorporate pre-record stuff, uh, as well as the interactive things that you have, as well as things like polls, as well as, uh, you know, hands up and getting those sort of things happening as well. So with your pre-records, the one thing I'm also thinking about there is if you've got it available and you've got something sitting on your website, put it on Dart Learning. It's, it costs you nothing and it sits there then and teachers will be able to find it a lot easier. We have actually done with those uh, pre-record stuff for on-demand, put in a five-year limit now. So pretty much after five years, if you've got something on demand, it will fall off and you'll have to put it on again. You'll be notified that that's going to happen. And that's just to keep things current on the website because we're realizing that you know, it's going to grow and grow the amount of events that are there. The other thing with these on-demand things is we do suggest putting in some sort of a booking system for them. So that helps you actually gather statistics on it. 
uh, and then available after a live event. So if you are doing a live event, a one-off, then possibly making that available afterwards means that those that missed out on watching the live event get to watch it later and it can still sit there as a resource for teachers to view afterwards. Right, the other big thing, make it easy. So teachers want this to be as quick as possible. If they're looking for a resource, they don't want to have to go and um, look at different websites. They don't want to have to go and do multiple clicks to book in for something. They want to make it as easy as they can to book in. So one of the things that our quality assurance team do, with Leanne and Jan, is they make sure that there's not too many clicks involved with getting into that particular session for a teacher. So uh, please be aware of, of you know, the multiple clicks. So that's what teachers want to be easy. They also want relevant tagging so that the searching is not onerous. So when they type in a tag, they go in through a KLA, they don't want to see everything come up in the feed. They only want to see what's actually relevant. The other thing we've put on our website is the specific learning intentions and success criteria. There's resources for you to have a look at and make sure that you can add a couple of things in, a few of the curriculum codes so that the teachers can find what they're looking for really quickly. And those codes mean something to the teachers. I so said the resources are there for you if you have a look under the help for our content providers to actually find those learning intentions, a few examples in there, as well as uh, links to other things across NESA and those places. Okay, creating series of virtual excursions. So this helps cement the learning for the, te this is what the teachers have said, it really cements the learning for them. It also helps break down events that might be too long uh, and it helps them with their measurable outcomes giving pre and post material so that the teachers can do an activity beforehand means that your virtual excursion may be a bit shorter and then they can go and maybe post event and have that continue. So it's that continued conversation around the highlight, which is the virtual excursion that they get to have with you. I mentioned the series, there's definitely still room for one-on-one, -on -one, for one-offs, I should say, uh, because they get your large audience. And that's also the way that you obviously get leverage to your other events. So uh, stick with those one-offs as well. And that's when you, you know, get the special guest speakers and have other great content for them. Okay, the future. Everyone seems to be doing it today, talking about what used to be, but this popped up from 11 years ago where we went and did a presentation from Polycom. So if you don't mind, I am going to show you a little video about where the technology was 11 years ago. Interaction, just as though you were sat across from me in the conference room here in Singapore. So it really is about trying to forget the technology and ensure you get that maximum collaborative experience. But obviously it's not just about audio and video, it's about being able to interact, to share content, Yeah. Crazy. So as he said, it's not actually just, um, it, it is about maximizing that collaboration. It is about being interactive and sharing content and not making everyone focus on the actual technology. I don't need to tell you people that having a look at what's out there at the moment, I think um, you're all doing that really well but I also had to put there that you still can't share the pizza, which is a bit annoying. Still I'm talking about food there, Ben. <clears throat> um, collaborations. So one of the things that we have been doing for the last couple of years is Virtual Week in Canberra. So I did wanna share a few little stats on Virtual Week in Canberra and how that's been working and how we will be continuing it for 2023. Um, last year, we had 10 organizations from Canberra attend. We had 27 and a half thousand students register. Um, we had a reach across 1,431 classrooms. And we had a social media views of 65,000 with over 10,000 website page views and a star rating of 4.4. So the digital marketing program, we, as you can see there, we reached email campaigns, Facebook ads, Instagram stories, the Dart Learning homepage banner, which is another great way to get plenty of coverage. Um, 
the Department of Education schools, Department of Education teams, uh, and also Yammer. And what we found from doing these collaborations is one, it helps settle providers in so they know what they're doing. And we ended up getting quite a few extra content providers doing these collaborations. And then it also gave them confidence to go ahead and do other things. And then it also helped give coverage to events that they already had. So this is, was a free event for any students that wanted to come along and obviously free for all the providers. And I will say that Graham Grant and Jacob Nankerville uh, helped greatly in bringing this to fruition in 2021. And Graham did a lot of the heavy lifting for 2022 with his event. So thank you to him. Um, yeah, and we're hitting those remote schools and people that aren't getting to Canberra. We're also getting a lot outside of New South Wales. And you all know this, but pretty much our audience is 30% from outside of um, department schools. So that means home schools, other states and other countries that attend as well. So we're finding that Virtual Excursions Australia as well are fantastic at collaborations and definitely keep, um, keep doing those because they're really worthwhile doing. Sorry about that. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this rolling ball. Okay, the other thing we've done is website improvements for our content providers when it comes to collaborations. So on Dart Learning Now, you can tag other content providers so that the event will show that it's from multiple providers. And I'll do a little shout out here to Megan from the Museum, uh, Maritime Museum, who gave us a few suggestions which we have now incorporated and made those changes to the Dart Learning website. So if you're a collaborator on an event, one person can list it, one provider can list it, and then the other provider can still gather the statistics, see who's booked into things uh, and run reports and see numbers and everything for that particular event as well. Coming in 2023, we'll be making it so that the collaborators will be able to help do edits to the event as well. So that's still in the pipeline. Focuses for 2023. Okay. These are our two focuses for 2023. Women in STEM. The department is looking at the women in STEM strategy for 2023 to 26. So they're really looking at hopefully getting more content out there for women in STEM and also student careers. So sometimes there's a little bit of a, a, a double up on this particular area. If you have any content that you think can fit into these areas, my suggestion is to put it on. We have created specific tags for this. So all you need to do is tag your event if it's relevant. And, um, or you've got something you think, hey, when we're talking before about what are you planning on doing for the year? I think it's great that we've got some direction, that we see what education is asking for and that we know what the teachers and um, the department are looking for to improve within the education area. So there are focuses for 2023. Another focus is to strengthen and maximize our digital marketing plan. We already think it's great, but there's always room for improvement. One of those areas that we've really improved is with the New South Wales Department of Education itself. So we're now dealing with comms and engagement where we have links for certain days in the school calendar. Now, as you know, on the website, we have a school calendar. It um, has, goes through four terms and Jan Rosborzik, who works in our team, has done a lot of work on this, where we actually have each term special days. If you've got something that fits into that calendar, you can go and tag it with a special day. And then what will happen is the department themselves, we have links into them and they'll promote anything that's on Dart Learning that sits under that particular school calendar event. So for instance, Harmony Day is coming up. We've got anything along Harmony Day that fits in, then it will get promotion with us, but it will get promotion across the department when they send out links to Harmony Day as well. So that's going to get you a bigger audience and cast the net wider. Cross promotion with content providers. So um, what we're hoping to do here is when we get an event listed on our socials, and you can see the little image that's at the side of the slide here, we do lots of socials, we promote your things all the time, but we wanna make sure that you know that your event's being promoted. So at the moment, we talk about being a one-man band or you're a one-man band. 
some of you are and some of you aren't. If you work for an organization and you're doing the education area, then you don't know what's happening on socials. So we're looking at ways that we can notify our content providers that a social is going up for them. And then they can let the rest of their organization know and spread that spread that message and um, share that particular uh, social post across the networks. Okay. Uh, there is also, I know most of you know about this, but you can request a social media post and that's set up to be automatic on our website as well. So get onto that if you haven't been doing that. And of course, continue connecting an audience to you guys and your fabulous content, your fabulous virtual excursions, which means what we have actually done, uh, this is on the website yesterday. Here is the launch, the first time everyone's going to see it, but we've done a promotional video for our teachers. So this will be distributed everywhere. And hopefully what that means, it'll drive more traffic and it just gives teachers, parents, um, and homeschools, everyone, an understanding of what dart learning is and what they can find there. So I'm going to show you the video. Karen has said it's a little bit jumpy. We did a bit of a run through before and uh, we can get to questions after I finish showing it. One sec. Dart learning, bringing the world to your classroom. Dart Learning is a free service provided by the New South Wales Department of Education to assist teachers, parents and students in finding curriculum enriching virtual excursions. The Dart Learning website has over 3,500 virtual excursions and 150 different institutes and organisations providing content for all subjects, stages and key learning areas. One searchable website where you can find incredible live, on-demand and by request learning experiences with new content added regularly and loads of events targeting the school calendar throughout the year. Hear from experts in their field as they engage students in fun and interactive learning experiences targeting curriculum while visiting world leading zoos, galleries, research facilities and museums. Dart Learning saves you time. Search the website via strands, substrands, special filters school calendar of events or key learning areas to find multiple events from a diverse variety of organizations. Setting up your profile is easy and you can select targeted preferences for virtual excursions. The Dart Learning website personalizes your experience by recommending content based on your targeted preferences. We've made the booking process simple. From quick overviews of each event to auto-filling your details, easy instructional guides, and the ability to utilize different platforms and devices when joining an event. Stay up to date by joining our newsletter and follow us on our socials. Dart Learning, bringing the world to your classroom. Big thank you to all of those content providers that sent us some video that we could use during the making of our promo video. Uh, it was very helpful. And hopefully you saw some of your content up there. And also a big thank you to Karen and Ben for organizing a little conference in their spare time for Virtual Excursions Australia. Keep up the fantastic work you're doing with Virtual Excursions Australia. It is one of the first things we suggest to content providers when they join us. We tell them to go and uh, join Virtual Excursions Australia because there is a wealth of knowledge and you are great sharers and it's well worth them joining the network. Thank you, Bonnie. That was awesome. that was fabulous um, and, and very useful. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm just stopping your share. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, where to start? Um, one, I just think the ideas that what are coming up and what the changes that you've made to um, the Dart Learning website for the easeability of searching for the teachers and parents, but also for content providers um, listing and providing information as well have been have been great. And um, I think a few comments have come up through the chat as well about the amazing marketing. And I think a lot of us have been able to see um, our profiles being being shared as well. And um, that's been amazing. 
Um, so, yeah, and obviously well done on the, the massive spike that you've been able to see in terms of responses from teachers. Um, so it's been really great to see and it's nice that you've got the team behind you helping out as well. So the least we can do is provide um, great new fresh content for um, for the teachers as well. And it's just reminded me that I need to put in a social request for Sea Week that's coming up. Sea Week, yeah. Up around the corner. I think, I think I'm on that. Don't need to worry about it. You can set up your list. I've done it. <laughs> Thank you. That's the, the, the one advantage of putting so much stuff up and doing the collaborations as they're, they're linking specifically to the calendar of events that they pop up in your radar. Um, even if I haven't got around to doing it yet. So that's great. Um, so guys, this is your opportunity to um, ask more questions of Bonnie. For those of you that are going to be joining us for the meeting uh, later on this afternoon, um, you'll also have another opportunity to, to ask some, you know, nuts and bolts questions um, from Bonnie as well. But if you've got any sort of big picture questions on that presentation and sort of the future direction of what we need to be doing to get the best connection with um, teachers, um, this is your chance. Please know we're always open to suggestions because you are the end users. So it's the same with the, the teachers. You are the end user of dart learning. So it needs to be doing what we want it to do. So we need that feedback from you. Like Megan did when we need some changes and it happens quite a bit. People suggest things and we do what we can to get those things happening. I will say very quickly, uh, the other thing that we've come across when you talk about providing new content, Karen, is also refreshing what you've got there. There was an exercise done recently with Leanne Stone and um, Parliament New South Wales where they were saying they're not getting as much traction as they'd like to get. We didn't feel like they were doing a very good job of selling themselves. So we suggested doing some more different photos to show what their contents are about, changing uh, the outline so teachers knew exactly what they were going to get. They were listing events, live events um, every day. So we said maybe you know supply and demand and Put up a by request so that teachers can suggest a date and then once one teacher books into a by request you make that event then a live event and others might book on that particular day they have had a huge spike in things just from doing that so it is worthwhile sometimes going through what you've already got and i know we ask you quite a bit to go through anyway and say oh retag this and pop this on but that's just the way it is i mean we're constantly innovating and constantly changing but we are open to what you've got to what you've got to suggest and we really love you to take uh, that active approach with what you've already got listed mm. thanks that's um that's really important as well and something that um running two um, profiles. I sometimes am really good at doing things for Virtual Excursions Australia and staying on top of the tagging because I'm doing, you know, events on behalf of multiple organisations, but completely forget to do my own business. Um, and then look back and go, oh, but I'm sure I did that. But of course, you know, so think about that as well. If you are working across different departments within your organisation, you might be doing really great sort of marketing and connection in one area, but then forgetting that, oh, you've got this great dark, um, learning profile that you can, you know, utilise as well. And I find, you know, the when I look at the bookings that we get coming through, you know, I do see some responses of how did you hear about this? That's, you know, the VA newsletter and I hear Facebook, so the marketing that we're doing there. But often, dark learning website, dark learning website, dark learning website. So it is certainly a way that most of the um, uh, the teachers and um, homeschool parents are finding our content is through that portal. So it is definitely a great opportunity to, to list your events and those on-demand ones, as Bonnie was saying. Um, I unfortunately don't have sort of a booking system on mine, um, but I can see the, um, the YouTube views. And I use that as my tracking um, matrix. And I can see when a teacher sent it to, you know, certainly back in the day when it was to a whole class at home, but I can still see it when now when it's like, oh, there's a whole stack of people. So it could have been, you know, one cohort of stage, three students all sort of watching it in the classroom on, you know, six different classes within the same day. And I can see these little spikes come up as it's been shared through a teacher network or all those kinds of things so it is definitely worthwhile anything you've pre-recorded before use even if you cut it up as um smaller pieces if you don't want the whole program to be up and that might take away from people booking your life use it as a marketing opportunity do little parts of it and say hey this is a teaser 
or you know use it for different um, events coming up if it's on a topic. Do it as an on-demand, a mini version of an on-demand. Um, and then always have links back. I think all of the um, speakers today have spoken about that post-visit um, resource um, or pre-visit resource. Use, use it as a pre-visit um, to a face-to-face -face excursion if you have people on site. Or you can use it as a follow-up with links to your website. So then, then they're using the video to connect to your digital organisation's resources um, as well. So really, you know, someone once said, you know, write once, publish many times. And I think it's the same way with um, video creation as well. If you've got it, record it, use it as often as you can. And can I also say that when you talk about video, if you've got little snippets of videos, we're going to be looking this year at using video to do promotional stuff. So where Megan was showing the tour of going through, you know, and looking at the different dinosaurs, possibly a little snippet of that would be something that would really sort of generate a bit of interest. The other thing that we'll be introducing this year, talking about those sorts of traffic and having your snippets um, up there, Karen, as a on demand, is a dashboard for providers, which will show you the amount of traffic you're getting to your provider profile, show oh. you uh, your Facebook, uh, any socials you've done, any, any reports, and so you'll be able to report on those things. Um, as I said, we can't track what happens once you leave our site, but we'll hope to be able to give you something that you can utilize for from anything you've got on the website. I can, def I can definitely also add to um, definitely use the marketing um, that is going in pretty well. Uh, we've been involved in a collaborative event which is launching tomorrow. And I can tell you, Bonnie, <laughs> that the um, since that went out a couple of days ago, it did spike um, people registering. So it does, it does work. So good to hear. Thanks, Ben. So guys, you have Bonnie. What do you want to know? <laughs> We're so used to having me. Look, <laughs> 10 to 12. Yeah, you can give them 10 minutes back in their day and they can have them this afternoon with, you know, once they've all had something to eat. <laughs> um, well, if there aren't any other questions, I think that's probably exactly what we're going to do. It's been a really big morning um, of fabulous content, lots of things to get inspired. I've got lots of little notes on pieces of paper. I've been updating our um, conference training manual that has lots of information about, you know, being engaging, lighting, technology, all of those kinds of things, but also the links to CILC, the links to DART, Bonnie, Megan and Jason's LinkedIn profiles and organisation websites as well. So you'll be able to have a copy of that with the recording um, hopefully tomorrow um, to, you know, keep you inspired and think about those collaborations. You know, you might not have had a question now, but if you think of something tomorrow, everyone that's involved in um, the conference today um, is more than happy to help answer your questions um, down the line as well. Okay, I think that's it from us here. Uh, Ben's just, ben, and just a big thanks to Ben for all of the um, back end chat and links. It's something that I rely very heavily on. Um, I can always tell when his hands are moving that um, he's got something fabulous to add into the chat. So that's been really uh, helpful and important as well. So yeah, big thank you to all of our speakers. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the Virtual Excursions Australia meeting, um, we have a break. Um, so that's on at one o'clock. If you haven't registered, you still can. Um, if not, we'll have a recording of the meeting as well. So thank you everyone for taking your time out um, to join us today. And for those of you who will be watching this later on the recording, on behalf of Ben and I from Virtual Excursions Australia, um, it's a fabulous way to start the year um, and get inspired. And yeah, I've oh, got so many great ideas of events that we can um Put forward. So yeah, let's um continue the conversation. Um, do you want to add anything there, Ben? You haven't think yourself, and I'm gonna do that on behalf of everyone here. I yeah, I, I press buttons here and there, but you did the same and you made some things happen behind the scenes. Thank you so much. And uh thanks again for everyone who's joined us right across Australia and across the ocean. Uh and I've just put a thing in the uh the, the chat there. Please consider sharing out virtual excursions Australia to your colleagues who are in other organizations. This is quite necessary and was informed to us by a couple of politicians that we need an actual collaborative voice when 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 possible. And so uh, that's the whole point of VA is to represent you, the providers, all together with one voice and uh, with a bit of 
yeah, a bit of gumption behind us because we between us all we reach hundreds of thousands of students as bonnie said and it's straight up tracked it's real <laughs> so uh look thanks again everyone this is going to adjourn and uh hope to catch you very very soon excellent see you later everyone <laughs>